Uh, President John F. Kennedy, speaking about Presidents Lincoln and Roosevelt, said that they understood that the life of the arts, far from being an interruption, a distraction in the life of a nation, is very close to the center of a nation's purpose and is a test of the quality of a nation's civilization. These three politicians saw the value that the arts bring to our communities and recognized that the arts are not just diversions from the work and business of our existence, but rather a critical part of it. It's what makes us human and connects our experience. I'm here tonight to ask that you nine politicians follow the examples set forth by so many of our great leaders in a small but meaningful way and join us in supporting our local arts through Side Street. I, like many here tonight, have benefited from the programs, events, activities, and educational efforts that Side Street has brought us over the years. But we can and should do more by investing in this critical resource within our community at this time. In Elgin's 2024 strategic plan, as signed by all of you, we outline a vibrant community as a strategic outcome area, highlighted further by a bullet point to develop commercial arts and entertainment hubs. Surely, supporting an organization like Side Street is a step in that direction. I believe in this moment, Side Street has stepped up with a vision toward a more vibrant community and seized that opportunity to further contribute toward that end. And tonight, I hope to see our leadership put our investments where our strategic plan is and support this endeavor. Thank you. Thank you. Hallie Morrison. Hello, everyone. My name is Hallie San Clemente Morrison. Uh, thank you for the time tonight. I'm an interdisciplinary artist, curator, community organizer, and teacher, and I've been affiliated with Side Street for almost a decade. I currently work with them as their advocacy coordinator, which has granted me a meaningful glimpse into Side Street's long-standing impact for the greater Elgin area and actually the Chicagoland area. According to a national report called Ready to Innovate, 72% of companies say creativity is the number one skill they seek when hiring. Yet when we know that the arts are generally the first subject and resource to be defunded across Illinois. So where then should our community hope to develop their creative abilities for the sake of employment, leading healthy lives, and contributing to society? Creativity is not only something that certain people are born with, everyone is actually born with it, and it depends on where the community chooses to foster that creativity and its individuals in order for the whole community to thrive. For our current workforce and for future workforces, Side Street is filling a critical gap, serving as a place where people can develop those creative abilities that are so desirable for hiring. Through free art classes, exhibition and performance opportunities, cultural events, sales opportunities, commissions, networking, and career building opportunities, Side Street has impacted and brought thousands of people to Elgin for creative development. Furthermore, Side Street has created jobs and helped people to stay in Elgin so that they don't need to seek employment and creative development elsewhere. With the opening of 62 South Grove, Side Street will be able to serve even more people, including our community members with accessibility requirements, as it's critical that creative development opportunities are equitably offered across the Elgin community. Serving more community members through the ADA compliant build out will ensure that Side Street can continue to innovate creative development opportunities for people of varying needs. So thank you for your time and for your support of the transformation that will manifest for a greater Elgin community. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mayor, Council Members. Continuing with the theme on cultural arts and special events. Uh, our director, Amanda Harris, will be discussing the arts and economic prosperity six study founding, findings. Um, Ms. Harris will then be followed by Kate Scorza Ingram of Create Today, who will be presenting the draft financial model and strategic plan for the city's cultural arts and special events department. Ms. Harris will then come back to the podium and close with a presentation on the special events programming plan for 2024. Good evening, Ms. Harris. Good evening, and thank you all for, well, you didn't have a whole lot of choice, right? You were having this meeting. I just uh, took over a little bit. So tonight, uh, as you have heard, is all about the arts all the time, every day, forever. But I get the pleasure of talking to you about specifically what the city is doing and the plans that we have coming and the work that has taken, taken place over the last two years. Um, 
So in 2022, the city partnered with Americans for the Arts for the Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 study, uh, which looks at the economic impact of the arts and culture sector in a specific place. Tonight, we're going to look at what the heck AEP6 is. Uh, we're going to look at the impact of those results. We're going to review the results themselves, and then we're going to have a tiny little demonstration uh, on, on the economic impact calculator. So the AEP6, as I've said, is a study on how the arts and culture sector impact the economic livelihood of a specific community. In our case, that looked specifically at Elgin. Um, it's important that we understand the methodology used in the study so we can understand the ways in which the data can be used. Uh, the customized model that Americans for the Arts uses is called Implan. It was developed and vetted by economists. It measures the economic relationship between hundreds of different industries in each geographic area, again, in our case, Elgin. This, in turn, enables localized economic impact results to be derived, which is what we're going to be looking at today. Um, a good way to understand it is $50 spent in two different cities, even if they're in the same state, have a different economic impact. It takes more than 1 million calculations to derive the economic impact data for each community. That includes us. Another thing that's important to talk about is the conservative approach. The conservative approach used by Americans for the Arts as a part of this study ensures that the results are based on actual data. The figures that are used are supplied by the organizations and the people attending events. They are not estimates, nor are they projections. Organizations that support and share this include ICMA, Actors Equity Association, the Black Legislative Leaders Network, the United States Conference of Mayors, and many, many more. All of these organizations use this study and these findings as a matter of course. <clears throat> Let's talk about arts and culture. You'll see that that's italicized on this slide here, and that's for a reason. As a part of the Arts and Economic 6 study, Americans for the Arts expanded the terminology to include and culture as a deliberate equi equity strategy. This is because some communities of color, this is because some communities of color arts organizations often identify as culture organizations. So it was a way to include those organizations that are absolutely doing art and culture activities as a part of this study. Furthering that conservative approach to the data, the study focuses only on the nonprofit arts and culture sector. That's really important because this data is from 2022 into 2023. Note that at that time, the big summer concert series that the city hosted had not taken place. So those results, those, that information, that data is not included in this. In AAP6, both local and non-local impacts are counted in the analysis. The data tables in the report appendix provide all the details. Um, that is all widely available on the website as well as a one sheet, the full report for Elgin, the full national report, brochures in English and Spanish, way more information than anybody would ever use except for me because I really enjoy all of the data. <laughs> so let's look at the numbers. This study was the sixth Arts and Economic Prosperity 6 study to take place over 30 years. This time there were 373 participating communities of which Elgin was one. There were almost a quarter million responses across the nation. 16,399 arts and culture organizations participated and submitted information as a part of the study. And there was a 17% BIPOC Alana response rate. That's the first time that information has ever been calculated and was strategically calculated. So let's talk about the results. Again, all this information is available on the website, so I'm going to provide you a high level overview. 86.7% of respondents responded that their attendance at the arts and culture event instilled a sense of pride in their neighborhood or community. That's for Elgin. 84.9% stated that they would feel a sense of loss if that didn't exist anymore. 24.6% of attendees were non-local. Those are people coming from outside Kane and Cook County. Of that 24%, 92.8% reported that the primary reason that they came to Elgin was to attend that event. Now look at the numbers. 
$8.5 million in economic activity was generated in Elgin as a direct result of arts and culture programming. 3.7 million of that was event-related spending by arts and culture audiences. $21.35 is put directly into the community by non-local event attendees outside of the cost of tickets. So if you pay to come to an event from outside of Kane or Cook County, you're leaving an additional $21.35 in Elgin. Now I'm going to show you the economic impact calculator. This is also on the website. This was de de designed by Americans for the Arts specifically for Elgin. So if you go to the website and you scroll down, here's where you'll see all of the data. There's also all these little, little treats. Um, if you click on economic impact calculator, it will take you to this. This is a real-time calculator, again, based on information supplied by Elgin. This can be used to determine the impact of an organization, a program, or an event. For an argument's sake, and because I happen to know the information in my brain, we're going to use Nightmare on Chicago Street. We know that about 18 to 20,000 people attend Nightmare, so that number is pre-populated in here for us. For expenses, let's put 600,000 to include labor. Attend attendance at the event, we know, is approximately 18,000 people. From here, all you do is click Calculate and simply scroll down, and you get real-time information. You get total expenditures for the audience, for the organization, and within the community itself. According to this calculator, in total, Nightmare on Chicago Street generates $151,000 in federal tax revenue, $29,000 in local tax revenue, and $40,000 in state revenue. Total expenditures for audiences and organizations top $1 million. Again, this is a calculator that is available on the website. All of the organizations in Elgin and outside of Elgin can use it. And for those who are thinking, maybe I'm going to give Elgin a try, this is compelling information for them to look at and see exactly what Elgin has to offer. So with that, I am going to hand it over to our lovely consultant. And I have to tell you that they had the unfortunate <laughs> uh, experience of their plane getting hit by lightning. It's fine they weren't on it. It was on the ground. But they're not here now, so we're doing this via Zoom. Um, and that also means that we get our lovely Kyle as well. Um, so I will, the screen is up for them. I'm going to give them a short introduction. We've been working with Create Today for about two years now. They're very tired of my face and my antics. I'm Butch, too. He's not here, so I can pick on him. Um, and they are here to present a draft version of the strategic plan and financial model for the Cultural Arts and Special Events Department. Um, we embarked on this some time ago to figure out exactly what the community wanted, and we worked with the community for those two years. Everything that you're going to see tonight is a direct response from the community. Other than staff providing data and information, this is all community-based. So with that, I am going to hand it over to these two lovely humans um, and let them take it from here. Thank you very much, and thank you very much for having us on Zoom. We both sincerely apologize for not being able to be there in present um, and in person. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and we're going to have a brief start, and then I believe, Amanda, you're going to do a second introduction. Is that correct? Or no? Yeah, I can do a second introduction. I think I already said it, but I can say it again. No, I'm just okay. kidding. <laughs> okay, so um, Amanda's just going to talk very briefly about you know, why did we do the market study plan, um, and then we're going to have a brief discussion about what the plan actually looks like, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about uh, what we looked at, the process, and some of the outcomes. Yes, so part of this work included a market study, as Kate talked about. Um, and the importance of that was ensuring that what we were doing in Elgin not only had a place, besides the fact that we all really like what we do most of the time, um, but that we're competitive, that we're, we're not dropping, you know, a, a, a tier in a bucket that is already full, that we're making sure that we're doing something that's unique. Um, additionally, it's making sure that we know that our venues are meeting the need of the community as well as those who want to come here. So it's incredibly comprehensive in that way of thinking. Um, like I said, we had 
uh, well, they'll tell you, but I'm gonna brag too. We had more than 800 individual touch points with community. Um, that included a whole slew of things. We had a lovely advisory committee made up of members of the community who are directly tied to uh, the arts and culture uh, sector here. Um, who helped advise us and make sure that we were on the right path, that it wasn't just us yelling into a cave by ourselves. So, um, yeah, I will take it. Le let it go back over to you, Kate. Okay, and I'm actually going to ask Kyle Fitless uh, to start. So thank you very much, Amanda. Kyle, go ahead. Sure. Hey, everyone. Uh, good evening. Uh, I'm going to see you all again. Uh, I actually uh, presented at a city council meeting uh, last year. I believe in July or August, so it's great to be here again and, and um, share some uh, exciting information about the work we've done. So I just wanted to take a step back and talk a little bit about what we did. I think this is important context and sort of a foundation for talking about the recommendations, which Kate will go over in just a little bit. But essentially our process had four distinct phases, uh, listening, learning, planning, and ensuring success. And throughout the process, you know, there were tons of opportunities really for the community to engage with the process. Um, here on this uh, uh, diagram, you can see that all of the um, different items highlighted in pink were essentially um, sort of touch points with the community. Um, we also had an advisory committee, as, as Amanda mentioned, um, that really met throughout the process and that included city staff, uh, members of the community that represented various arts and cultural organizations, um, also representatives from educational institutions, businesses, and residents of Elgin. So um, again, sort of a central theme here is this um, really creating a process that was community engaged, community informed, and community guided. We always like to say that we conduct these uh, processes with the community, not on the community, right? So we really wanted to ensure that there were opportunities for the community to, to provide their feedback, um, to help sort of provide ideas, opportunities, and strategies for how we wanted to move forward. And I will um, actually review all of those different touch points on the next slide here. Great, so as Amanda mentioned, we had um, about 800 touch points across the process. Um, those were touch points where we connected directly with the community. Um, again, we wanted those touch points to be accessible, so we included um, both in-person, virtual meetings, uh, we had an online survey, um, as well as some opportunities to provide feedback in both Spanish and English. And here you can see the different um, sort of research or community touch points that we did throughout the meeting or throughout the process. Um, we started off with a community kickoff meeting. We had stakeholder interviews, um, an online survey, and just wanted to point out that um, we had 400 and almost 450 uh, responses out of the total 650 were in fact Elgenites. Um, the survey was translated in Spanish and English, and out of the total respondent uh, sample, 25% of those participants identified as BIPOC or multiracial. We then followed up with some in-person community conversations or focus groups. We had almost 70 uh, people participate in those. It was a combination of in-person and Zoom. Uh, we held an in-person meeting that was also um, a bilingual uh, conversation with Spanish translation at the Hemen Center. Um, we also conducted another in-person meeting at the Center of Elgin and then had several Zoom conversations with folks. So what we learned from these 800 touch points is that there's already a lot working well in Elgin, right? We heard that there is a strong commitment from the city to support arts and culture. We heard a lot about a sense of collaboration, collegiality, and really great partnerships that help to sort of promote and create the wonderful programs that you all have. Um, we heard a lot about these really notable cultural assets and resources. Um, you know, a lot of communities don't have the, the types of venues that are already in Elgin and that support the sort of robust uh, programming that you all have. And then lastly, we heard about the strength and diversity of the arts and culture community. And really thinking about like diversity in the broadest sense. We can think about artistic discipline, different types of organizations, or just really the diversity of the local community that provides such a, that provides such a rich, richness and context to a lot of these arts and culture programs. So in addition, as, as Amanda mentioned, um, to this work, we also wanted to sort of contextualize it with a market study. 
So we broadened our focus and looked at data to help us really characterize the local landscape and also understand Elgin's role in this regional arts and culture ecosystem. So what did we do? We collected and analyzed data on local and regional demographics, uh, including trends and projected population growth. We did an environmental analysis that examined 28 arts and cultural venues um, within a 50 mile radius of Elgin. Um, and again, these were comparable in size to the different venues um, in Elgin, both, um, both performan performing arts centers, such as the Hemmings Cultural Center, or outdoor venues and spaces. Um, and then lastly, we looked at, at um, two local communities, uh, the village of Schaumburg and the city of Aurora, to better understand how mun municipalities are supporting and resourcing arts, culture, and special events. And this was one of the uh, outputs from that research and just wanted to um, quickly review one of the observations that we came away with and that there is a projected population growth where more and more individuals will be moving to the suburbs and kind of pairing that with another observation is that by 2050 is projected that the greater Chicagoland area um, will be majority BIPOC communities. So black, indigenous, Asian American, um, Hispanic or Latino or Latinx communities. Um, so we know that the city is uniquely situated to engage both the diverse communities um, who currently call Elgin home, but also new residents that will continue to move to the area. So collectively, the breadth of this data, right, uh, that was really grounded in the community and community voice, um, helped us to create the following recommendations, which my colleague Kate will review and discuss now. Thank you very much. Great, thanks so much, Kyle. All right, so first we're gonna look at how there's three intersecting strategies for DKs to resource the next steps uh, to expand their programming and to meet the community's needs. So the first is to diversify and increase funding and support through a stepped projected growth to the DK budget. This would be an internal opportunity. The second is to streamline internal processes and systems to remove barriers and support the community, another internal opportunity. And the third is to leverage community partners and individuals to connect needs with resources that already exist in the community, which would be an external opportunity. So what does the community want over the next five years? We collected information from hundreds of community members, as both Kyle and Amanda mentioned, and what we found was that the feedback really came together in three themes. The first was accessibility, around well-communicated community engagement, making sure that it's accessible to the broadest audience, both through increased awareness, um, information about the event, and increased representation at the event. The second is programming, thinking about authentic, balanced programming that celebrates and showcases the diverse interests of Elgin by including visual art in public places and programming that takes place across all Elgin neighborhoods. And the third is changes in DK's infrastructure and policy. Continued opportunities to collect feedback on programs, increasing the grants that are available, and increasing the channels of communication. So let's look at each of these individually. For accessibility, DK's has an opportunity to incorporate authentic and intentional representation in programming and in the promotions, which would otherwise be called marketing promote the events and activities through new channels and ensure that the events are welcoming and accessible by increased parking accommodations for persons with disabilities, improved wayfinding, descriptions of events and programming that are compelling, multiple languages and accessible, and increased free programming. So what's the opportunity for some external community partners? For the city of Elgin and DK specifically, one of the external opportunities around accessibility is to collaborate with community groups to help promote the events to their members. The second is authentic balanced programming, an opportunity for Elgin to celebrate its diversity and to increase opportunities for community building, to engage residents and draw people into Elgin through visual arts and programming on their stages, to increase the funding and access for public art, and ensure that the programming is balanced across not only venues, but neighborhoods, both indoors and outdoors. And the external opportunities for our partners would be to work with them, both the community and neighborhood groups, to 
to leverage the programming opportunities. And then finally, changes in the DK's infrastructure and policy. And this really came out to us during a lot of our conversations on site and in the focus groups. To increase staff and funding for additional programming. To deepen the communication engagement opportunities for community members. To make sure that information is spread widely and as early as possible. And posted in local channels and other relevant sources that are accessible and available to the community. And when I say community, I mean both internally within Elgin and externally outside of Elgin. As you saw in the materials that Amanda presented and in what Kyle was sharing, we heard from external outside of Elgin participants as well. And so they really also want to make sure that the information is available to them through their local channels. We want to see increased funding and access for artists and culture bearers and increased services for the Hemans Cultural Center. For instance, customer service, box office resources, and marketing. And for our external partners, our community partners, we see an opportunity to engage with them earlier to collaborate on projects, to host community conversations and feedback opportunities, and to utilize the box office services at the Hemans Cultural Center. So this sounds like a lot, so let's talk a little bit about the financial impact over the next five years. So we're going to look at the same information in two ways. This first chart looks at the balance between earned revenue, grant monies, and the requested city allocation over the next five years. This is displayed on a 100% scale, similar to how we look at earned versus contributed revenues in the nonprofit sector. It's divided up into the three areas that make up DKs, the Hammonds Cultural Center, Special Events, and the CAC. As we know, the ideal balance of the revenue streams, contributed, earned, and in this case, earned grant money and requested city allocation, is not a good or bad calculation, but rather based on a variety of factors. For Hemans and special events, both of these areas generate earned revenues that offset the requested city funding. For the Hemans Cultural Center, the programming is comprised of rentals and ticketed fee-based events. This means that there is a higher ability to generate earned revenues. Therefore, the Hemans Center will become less dependent on city funding over time, over the next five years, as projected between 2024 and 2028, as a percentage of overall revenues. The purple represents the net city allocation, and the green represents earned revenues. For special events, programming is community-focused and majority free to access which means that additional financial support will need to come in the form of some sort of contributed revenue or, or grant opportunity. We see here that it's projected to come from a combination of sponsorships, grants, which are the very, very slim little blue lines, and city funding, which again is the purple. For the Cultural Arts Commission, it is anticipated they will have a separate nonprofit they will be able to seek external grants and funding starting in 2025. Something is not available to them at the present time because they're part of a city government, whereas a nonprofit can generate funds and grants from foundations and additional support once they have a 5013 C3. That's highlighted in the blue grant line. Now let's look at this at the actual dollar amounts on a scale from $0 to $4 million. You can see here on these charts that it looks like it goes from 0 to 4,000. That's because it's shown in thousands of dollars on this slide. So when you look at these numbers, they look like 4,000, but it actually represents 4 million. We can see that the largest increases take place in 2025 and 2026, as the majority of changes take place in the first two years and then are followed by modest increases in 2027 and 2028 that mostly align with the cost of living or COLE increases. <coughs> now let's look more specifically at the impacts across DKs. For programming at the Hemans Cultural Center, it's in, projected to increase by 28% over the next five years. This will include genres that were most requested by the community, including rock and roll, comedy, uh, touring shows, performing arts for young people, amongst others. Hammonds will also be expanding in-house ticketing services 
for all of its users to have an improved rental experience and to streamline this service for audience members who will know that there's one centralized location to purchase and access tickets to attend events at the Hammond Center. <coughs> In order for the additional programming and services to be successful, Hammonds will require additional staffing to support these increases to maintain the front of house experience for both its patrons and visitors. Special events is projected to increase access to free programming by 36% over the next five years. This will include increased and new programming that takes place all over the city in all of the neighborhoods, both indoor and outdoor venues. Special events will also expand its marketing channels and efforts in communications to reach a broader and more diverse audience, including visitors from neighboring communities. As we saw, that's a significant opportunity, both in the AE6 study, as well as the research that we did through this process. In order for the additional programming and marketing to be successful, special events will require additional staffing to support these increases, maintain its majority free tickets, and continue to provide a comfortable environment at its events. And finally, the Cultural Arts Commission is projected to increase its investment in public art by 25% over the next five years. CAC will also be expanding the amount of grant monies that will be available for both individuals and organizations. It is projected to increase the funds that are available by 81%. In order for there to be additional monies, a new nonprofit will be established to increase access to state and foundation support. So in summary, we'll see a 31% increase in arts and events programming an 81% increase in grant funds, and a 25% increase in funds available for public art over the next five years. These will only be possible and successful with an additional investment from the city. The amount projected would be an additional $1.545 million by year five, which would be an increase of less than 0.4% of the total 2024 Elgin City budget. Thank you very much for letting us be a part of this process and for selecting CREATE today as your consultants as partners in your study. I hand it back to Amanda now. Thank you very, very much. <clears throat> and we will have plenty of time for questions afterwards. And I just wanted to let everybody know too, a recording of this presentation as well as uh, the, the deck and a draft version of the strategic plan is all available on the website. Um, you can go there, you can view those things, and there also is a feedback form for you to leave your comments and tell us if we're on the right track. Tell us if you love it, if you hate it. Uh, please be gentle. Uh, it was two years of work and I'm very, very tied to it. Um, so next we're going to talk about how we've used all of this information as well as some of the changes that the City Council approved in the 2024 City Budget um, to program 2024 and what all of that is going to look like. Tonight we're going to be looking at movies in the park, movies and concerts in the park, Fourth of July concert parade, into summer bash, La Fiesta, Nightmare on Chicago Street, co-sponsorships, and the Dowdle Project. First, we're going to talk about movies and concerts in the park because those, um, there's a lot of them. <laughs> so first we have movies in the park. Uh, movies in the park returns this year. As you might remember, staff proposed some changes as part of the budget process in 2023, which were approved. This enabled us to grow movies in the park from four to 11 offerings. Additional programming is also being included as a part of each of these movies. An example um, that I'm happy to share with you tonight is we'll be, we will be showing cars on July 26th. Staff is working with a local supplier to have cardboard boxes for the kids to come and decorate their car, creating a drive-in movie experience, which is gonna be really, really cute. Um, <laughs> all of this type of programming will be available at each, at each event. Uh, additional films that will be shown at various parks around Elgin, these include A Bug's Life, Trolls, Marvels, and more. Um, I've lost my, my, here we go. Uh, we also have two movies that will be shown in Spanish. All of the movies that I, we will be showing will have Spanish subtitles. 
The two that will be Spanish language focused include uh, COCO on August 23rd and instructions not included on September 7th. Again, all of this is reflected in the strategic plan that you just saw as well as what the city approved last year. The second film that I just mentioned, Instructions Not Included, is part of the Movies on the Lawn series hosted at the Hemmings South Lawn. These are geared towards an older audience. Um, additional films that are included uh, include the Adam Sandler double feature that you'll see here. This includes 51st Dates and Happy Gilmore. Attendees are encouraged to dress like Adam Sandler uh, and play around a mini golf before the event starts. It's going to be very fun. Shout out to Val Jennig over here who designed that lovely poster. Next, we're going to talk about concerts in the park. 2024 also sees this increase. It will be going from four concerts to 11 concerts. In response to last year's successful Banda concert, this year we have Banda Recruit. I'm going to mess it up. I'm going to mess it up. I did it so good in practice, and I've just ruined it. Um, that Banda is going to join us at Wing Park. Other bands include Libido Funk Circus and the Elgin Symphony Orchestra. The growth of the concert series also pre presented us with a unique opportunity to further respond to that strategic plan and what we heard from the community. That comes in the form of a concert series taking place at Lord's Park. The focus of that series is more acoustic and chamber music in style and again uses another venue. Lastly, food vendors are going to be joining us at several of these concerts this year because again that was something that was successful last year and voiced by the community. This year's 4th of July celebrates Vintage Americana. The event will kick off the annual parade in the morning with a pet parade taking place just before the traditional parade along a shortened route. Registration is currently open for 4th of July regular participants, not the pet parade yet, stay tuned. And many fan favorite performers will be coming back including the Jesse White Tumblers. The afternoon event starts with live music by Secondhand Soul, iPop, and All American Vinyl Band, a super band based out of Nashville. The Giant Light Bright, another fan favorite, returns along with an Elgin-sized Mount Rushmore that people will be able to stick their heads in and take photos with. Art-making projects include slime-making, pinwheels, sun catchers, and more, while food and drinks will also be widely available. New this year to lean into the Vintage Americana is a series of tabletop games and a pie-eating contest, and the event closes with our spectacular fireworks show. August 10th brings us to the end of Summer Bash, geared towards families and kids on August 10th. I think I just said that. This year's theme is Candyland. Event attendees will find themselves immersed in a life-size giant Candyland board game, where props will take over the north half of Festival Park. These props include a lollipop forest, a licorice maze, ice cream castle, and much, much more all complete with inflatable bounce houses. Other programming includes LED mini golf and art making activities such as candy necklace making, taffy sculptures, skittle painting, and more. Live music by The Little Merman from New York, Stash and Lover, the premier Taylor Swift tribute band, are sure to keep people happy all evening long. Food and drinks will be available on site as will community partners that offer youth and family services. The event closes with a fan favorite drone show. This year's event includes double what we had last year at 300 drones, more images, and is 10 to 15 minutes long in length. The headliner for the night will also have an ASL interpreter as part of the performance, increasing accessibility. All of these things were again iterated in the strategic plan, both for the Cultural Arts Commission, for, excuse me, for the Culture Arts and Special Events Department, as well as the city. La Fiesta de Elgin comes to, comes to Elgin on September 13th and 14th, kicking off Hispanic Heritage Month by celebrating Mexican Independence Day. Last year, the city produced Canta con Orgullo. This year, a little retooling and revamping took place to further refine that idea, and from that, La Fiesta was born. Once again, partnering with the Gail Borden Library, Friends of the Masons, and bringing in new partners, Centro de Información, Elgin State Bank, and the Villa Gomez Brothers Remax, this year's event has expanded into two days. Friday, September 13th, which I just realized is Friday the 13th and is kind of spooky, but it'll be fine. 
uh, will take place here at the Civic Center Plaza in the afternoon and into the evening. Programming includes traditional ballet folklorical performances, as well as the Grito, hosted by the Guild Board and Public Library, as well as live music by Mariachi Almar de Mexico. The parking lot will be a site for the car show hosted by Friends of the Masons, and we're partnering with the Downtown Neighborhood Association to bring Latino and Hispanic retail business owners down, stretching from the plaza down to the existing farmer's market. Saturday begins with the return of the fan favorite car caravan in the morning, while the afternoon and evening takes over Festival Park, which will be transformed into, again, an Elgin-sized version of Mexico City, complete with our own replica Angel of Independence, standing proudly in the park at more than 20 feet tall. Additional touches include piñatas, callejones, and the return of the popular Frida Kahlo's art sculpture. Art making, food, and drinks will also be on display for the, recept for the duration. I'm really excited to announce that partnering with Centro de Información and with the generous support of the Siegel Foundation, a Papel Picado traveling exhibit will be unveiled at the event. Local artist Cristina Colunga will interview Centro patients Centro patrons for their stories and turn those into images, which will be translated into the physical form with the assistance of the Elgin Area Men Shed and Youth Build. The sculpture will be on site during the event and then available as a touring exhibit for years to come. Live music is certainly the star of this event, and I apologize in advance. I did so good in practice, and I'm probably going to ruin these titles. Uh, but we have some exciting bands, and I'm announcing them here for the very first time, so you're very welcome. Uh, live bands include DJ Eddie P, Banda Peñasco Zacatecas, La Potencia de la Musica Norteña, Los Cementales de Nueva León, and our headliner, Banda La Sinaloense. Is it good? Okay. The evening finishes off with the second traditional grito taking place just before a fireworks celebration. Once again, this event is, was started last year, but again has been retooled in response to what we heard both from the AEP6 and directly from um, the community as part of our culture, arts, and st strategic plan. No presentation on events would be full without a, com a comment on Nightmare on Chicago Street. So Nightmare on Chicago Street returns to downtown Elgin October 19th. Tickets will be on sale in early June. Watch that Facebook page and the website for more information. And if you attend the 4th of July event, you might see a tiny, tiny preview. Next, I want to discuss the co-sponsorships offered by the city. This program was revamped again this year to, uh, from what was, to expand what was previously offered and provide additional guidance to, to potential applicants. To date, staff has received six applications Returning co-sponsored events that are in the hopper include the Pride Parade and Festival, the Elgin Valley Foxtrot, the Juneteenth Cultural Festival, and Love on the Lawn. New applications this year include the Michelada Festival, set to take place in June, and Area 22 Arts, Crafts, and Oddities Fair in August. Applications will be accepted until funding is exhausted, and we do anticipate more applications to continue coming in. I should also note that nothing has yet been confirmed, but we're really confident with all those people and initial conversations have taken place. Lastly, I wanted to discuss the Dowdle project. This is on the agenda for tonight, but I realized that I hadn't shown anybody a picture of just what this looks like. Here's an example of some of the work produced by Eric Dowdle. Eric Dowdle is a folk style artist. He visits communities, he talks to the people, he immerses himself. Um, himself and he creates one-of-a-kind pieces of art that's what's going to be happening here in Elgin the example that I'm showing you here is from present Pleasant Grove City what he's done is not all of these facades actually exist anymore instead he took historical images and he merged them with the existing landscape to make note of famous businesses landmarks that maybe didn't exist anymore but still had a place of honor in Elgin in in Pleasant Grove's history Additionally, you can see to the right there, that's a short description that goes along with the puzzle. It lets people who pick up this puzzle, this artwork, identify pieces in there. This is up for discussion later this evening and I'd be happy to answer any questions for you at that time. Until then, I will leave it with this lovely image of the drone show and I, I would be happy to answer any questions while we have a few minutes. Um, our consultants, Kate Scorza Ingram and Kyle Marinshaw, are also available on the line for any questions 
related to the Cultural Arts and Special Events Strategic Plan. Okay. Any questions for Ms. Harris or the uh, presenters tonight? Ms. Rauschenberg. Thank you very much. That was a lot. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and um, I think it'll take a little time to um, understand it all and uh, digest it. Um, just one of my questions that came off. First of all, it, it, it looks like, um, first of all, our um, arts projects for the year will look wonderful and, and exciting. So I want to say that first. Um, just one of the things I know that you studied was the use of the Hemmons. So since I've really been on council, um, the Hemmons has really been just a place people rent and the symphony orchestra. So, and, and it seemed to me that there were always these reasons like, you know, it's not big enough, it, you know, blah, 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 it doesn't make money, blah, 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 blah. So why, tell me why the Hemmons can be, um, and I don't want to say profit center, but profitable enough and, and interesting enough to bring people in new acts, et cetera. How are we doing that? That's an excellent question. That is actually happening for a lot of reasons. Okay. Number one, the renovation. <coughs> the renovation yeah. makes this, the building much more attractive, especially to those national touring acts. There were things in place, like, like the inability to, to back a truck directly up to um, the stage was a, was a huge problem. Um, so that's going to make the building much more attractive in and of itself. Second to that is, unfortunately, due to COVID, we did have some businesses, some regular renters that no longer use the space simply because they don't have that need anymore. So we do have some dates available. Um, the third piece is that programming manager. Right now we are hiring a person, or we are hoping to hire a person, um, who will get Elgin back on that touring circuit. And not just for the Hemmons, but for Elgin as a whole. You know, if we want Elgin to be a city of the arts, then, then people outside of this region need to be aware of that. And I feel like because of the work of a lot of the organizations that have been here for many years, and uh, that that's happening. But getting somebody with that knowledge base is absolutely going to be integral. And just to go along with that, mm -hmm. uh, I know um, I've talked several times about, because I, I believe that ECC has a pretty um, successful um, you know, cultural arts programming during the year. So we're working with them. Have you interviewed them and you're coordinating with their um, offerings? Yep, they were part of our advisory committee. Okay, great. Thank you. Mr. Good. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, thanks for the presentation. And I just will keep it short. I just want to say uh, thanks for the iteration cycles that you guys do so quickly. Um, and thanks to Council for funding this previously, at least. From my time on council, um, it seems like we were able to get behind you and make all this possible. So um, to see how much you've changed it from last year to this year is just impressive. So hats off to you and your team. Thank you. It's certainly not just myself, and it's certainly not just my team. None of these things are possible without the, the people that we work with in the community. This way, Ms. Powell. <clears throat> Thank you. Thank you, Amanda, for the presentation and to our partners who are here remotely. Um, a couple, well, quite a few questions. <laughs> um, first of all, I just want to say um, I'm excited to see uh, the recommendation and the plans moving forward to make the Cultural Arts Commission a standalone non for profit. This is similar to the model that we used with the Parks and Rec Foundation and opened them up to uh, being able to get outside support and grant funding. And I'm looking forward to this happening for the Cultural Arts Commission, um, or soon to be non for profit as well. Um, so I just want to note that. And that I just we, want to clarify too, it would be the Cultural Arts Commission as well as a non profit. It would kind of kind of split is what we're looking at right now. All still okay. part of the conversation, but the Cultural Arts Commission doesn't go away. Let me put it that way. Okay. Got it. Um, the strategic plan uh, that we we kind of got a glimpse up glimpse up tonight for um, cultural arts and special events is that going to come back to the council for final approval 
Yes, that is the plan. We, we wanted to get this in front of council so that you can see it, but also have it up both before and after this so that if the community has comments, questions, concerns, if they would like to see it, we want that input. As Kyle noted, this is all based on a feedback loop. So we'll, we'll keep that open for about two weeks. Um, we'll come back if there are no massive changes. We do anticipate coming back for a final approval sometime later this year. Great. And how will our partners be involved with helping us to execute this plan? Will they stay on board? Um, after the adoption of the strategic plan to help us fully execute that and like for example I made a note about <clears throat> one of the recommendations they made to help to streamline the approval process for special events how do we do that um, and I know staff obviously has some ideas but maybe there are some ideas that um, um, the study has and that our partners have that can assist us in that so how do we plan to incorporate that? Sure, so the, the plan really looks at the next five years. So not everything is gonna happen right away. Um, the way that we have it phased out, one of the things that was really important to us was to make sure that it was feasible. We can't bite off more than we can chew. We only have so much staff and we only have so much time, we only have so much money. Um, so while it is a great deal of change, it is also over five years. Um, they've been, the, the consultant create today has been really, extremely helpful when I say, hey, they, they get a piece of feedback. For example, last year, one of the pieces of feedback that they got in the focus group was, people want the, the Spanish subtitles. And I was like, great, I can do that immediately. So they've been really helpful in helping us identify places of immediate action, as well as tempering my excitement <laughs> when I say, oh, I wanna do everything all at once. Um, so it's not necessarily that they will stay on, rather than they've been sure to work with us to make sure that what we have in the plan is feasible for us to do, and that does include bringing on additional staff members to help with that workload. And I know that we approved um, quite a few additional staff um, for Hemmons as well as under special events and cultural services. Um, how many of those positions are included in what we saw today and what's, what's additional and left to be filled? Sure. Um, so the, the positions that were approved as a part of the 2023 budget are, were included in this count. Absolutely, they were. Even if they're not filled, they were included in that count. Okay. Um, what you saw as a part of, part of the, the kind of last in slides there uh, showed how many, how many new positions would be contemplated, again, over five years. Um, okay. I can provide additional breakdowns for what that looks like in coming years, so how many positions per year, but that would all be up to City Council's purview as a part of the budget discussion. Got it. Um, one of the things that you know is near and dear to my heart is um, Festival Park. So my colleague talked a little bit about the Hemmons and how do we u utilize that differently. Um, how do we incorporate or what improvements are being contemplated additional improvements because we have made some mm -hmm. but what type of additional improvements are being recommended to make festival park more accessible and usable um, for folks for our special events as well as our partners that are um, hosting special events there sure so that's kind of a two-part answer um, number one <clears throat> festival park is wonderful and beautiful and i love it but also there are are things, structures there that we can't do anything about. Uh, the first definitely being that it's in a floodplain. Uh, so we are kind of locked into what we can do as far as structural infrastructure improvements that can be made. And that doesn't mean that nothing can change. It absolutely can change. There's just a lot more work involved. At this point, since we are really only in year two of this Festival Park concert series, we're really only in year two for the co-sponsorship series, I am hesitant, staff is hesitant to make any permanent changes to Festival Park until we have a better understanding for what the community actually is going to be using that park for. I will also note that that park is used in so many different ways because it is an open field. Um, now to, to the accessibility question, one of the things that we did with the co-sponsorship this year was we made some purchases at the end of the last year that we were able to include in our co-sponsorship program that reduce and remove mm -hmm. some of those barriers such as bicycle fencing so people don't have to rent that to use festival park if they apply for a co-sponsorship and they're working with the city we can absolutely include that as part of it yes. so it's really just about thinking creatively about how we address those problems until we know a little bit more about what the future holds 
Got it. Um, fast forward to the preview of what our special events programming looks like for 2024. Again, another one of my faves. Um, excited to see the expansion and um, obviously some of the co-sponsorships that we're continuing and some of the new ones that you mentioned. Um, so movies in the park. I know at some point, um, let me just first say, I appreciate the fact that we do a lot of family friendly events. Um, I think that's key in our community. But I will have to admit, as a soon to be empty nester, yes, <laughs> I'm looking for, and I'm sure other folks in the community, and you and I have had this conversation, what type of activities, aside from Nightmare on Chicago Street, are we doing that appeal to singles in our community or adults in our community that want to come out and watch? I'm not going to say an adult movie because folks' brains yeah, I fell will into go. that trap too. Yeah, yeah mm -hmm. their brains go other <clears throat> otherwise. But like Purple Rain, mm -hmm. I think we talked about Purple Rain and having people come in a Purple Rain or or you know Prince themed gear. I think that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah. But something like that that appeals to a different demographic um, because I don't always feel when I look at our special events that we are when we talk about diversity that we're really diverse in what we're offering. I see, like I said, I see a lot of family theme stuff, which is great, but I don't see things that are maybe geared specifically towards our, our youth, our teenagers, um, maybe even our seniors or um, other um, BIPOC communities such as the African American community or our growing, our, our, our Asian community. We've expanded a lot of our, our Latin events, which is great because that's a large portion of our community, but I feel we're, we're kind of missing out on some of the other populations. So what are we doing to make sure that we're, we're being more inclusive there? That's a great question. I, you know, this meeting is only an hour, so I wasn't able to tell you about all the movies and concerts that we have planned, uh, but I can give you a short preview. For example, we the, the, the Movies on the Lawn program is geared more towards Teenagers, adults, you'll be able to get a drink from the Hemmons. You'll be able to sit outside and, you know, dress up as Adam Sandler. That's weird and fun. I would totally go to that. I don't know that I'm the demo, right, but I would. Um, additional movies include Zombieland. They include Breakfast at Tiffany's. So it really does, we really did try to kind of cast a wider net. Um, for some of those other movies, we are certainly looking at utilizing the Hemmons for those things, as well as other venues and facilities. That's all being discussed. Um, same thing for concerts in the park. That was the intent of the Lord's Park series. Not everybody wants to come to a giant concert that's going to have 3,500 people. Some people want to sit and they want to listen to chamber music in a beautiful venue, and that allowed us to do that as well. So there's always room for improvement, but strides are certainly being made. Got it. Um, and then last but not, actually two more questions, the vendor process for the city events. Can you talk through a little bit what that looks like and have there been any changes from last year? Yeah. Uh, so now on the city's website, if you go to the special events tab at the very bottom, you will see a vendor tab. Any vendor that wants to participate as a food vendor or a drink vendor uh, can go on and apply. It's a super easy form. We are also having that translated in Spanish. That will be live soon. Um, additionally, if there is a vendor that wants to apply to be a retail vendor specifically for uh, La Fiesta de Elgin, you can apply on that site as well. Um, we are working directly with those vendors. Communications and, and bookings have already started taking place. Um, and then we have a partner who is going to come in, and if we have not enough of one thing, we are working with uh, Brew Avenue Events to fill in the gaps of, oh, we don't have a, a churro truck. We need to make sure we get a churro truck and those kinds of things. Um, and they'll also help with the day of logistics because you're looking at the team. Is there a local preference placed on those vendors in terms of giving local based businesses preference in vending at our at our events? Yes, that question is asked on the form. Okay. So that will be part of the selection process. Mm -hmm. Perfect. And finally, um, Nightmare on Chicago Street. Um, yes. I'll just say yes. <laughs> um, the co-sponsorship program. <clears throat> Is there any thought given, because I know that you've um, you talked about changes that we made from last year to this year, seems very popular. I've heard good feedback about it. I've also heard feedback 
that we may want to look at tiering the funding maybe for next year. So like if it's a smaller event, there's a smaller pool of money, but some of our larger events like Love on the Lawn, mm -hmm. that they may be eligible for larger sums of money. Yep, that's something we've already had conversations about. Yep. Great, Absolutely. look forward to seeing that. All right, thank you. Ms. Martinez. Mayor, I'll keep it short. I just want to take advantage right now that we have a full room because we normally don't have a full room, so thank you. And I know it's not because of us. It thanks uh, to Animal Care and Control and National Public Safety and Mr. Shales and Mr. Duffy. Uh, because you guys are here, we have a full room. But um, I just wanted to take advantage to what uh, Councilwoman Rauschenberger had brought up. I know you're wondering what's going on at uh, the Hemmons. And the Hemmons is very outdated and we finally have found uh, some money to go ahead and, and update it. Uh, the analog has been updated, the sound and lightning, uh, the lighting that it has, but also finally the restrooms will be upstairs. Um, the dock will be updated so that we can uh, be appealing to um, new entertainment and the dressing rooms will be expanded as well. And I just wanted to say that. So thank you very much. Great presentation. Thank you. Anything else down this way? Mr. Dixon. Thank you. I just wanted to uh, mention something really quick because <clears throat> anytime you present, I always bring this subject up. And on the way into city council meetings tonight, uh, we walked past each other, Amanda, and you said, Corey, you're going to like what you hear tonight. And I did. Uh, I was so nervous. You were going to say, <laughs> you failed. Okay, great. <laughs> no, no, you, you did a great job. Uh, excellent job. Um, specifically uh, around the economic calculator and that's something I've been harping on for you know since I've been on council essentially saying we need to uh, measure the impact um, beyond the number of people who attend events but the financials of those folks who do come into our community and spend money or who already are here of course and are spending money so it was, you know it was really eye-opening to see that Twenty one point three million dollars. Twenty one. Yeah. Twenty one point three. Um, twenty one thirty five. Uh, twenty one thirty five. I'm sorry. Number um, and seeing how significant that was from people coming from outside of Cook and Kane County in our community uh, and spending funds here. So uh, one question I know we're, that we're running short on time. <clears throat> Excuse me is um, have we narrowed down, have, do we have the ability to narrow down like, like exactly where those numbers are coming from? Like, can we rank the communities one through five of who comes to our events the most? I'll leave it right there. That's a complicated question. So the Arts and Economic Prosperity Six study didn't just look at city events, it also looked at nonprofit organizations. So that might be information that they have that they could share um, for us. That's a little bit beyond the information that we are able to gather. This was literally myself, some volunteers, some people that I badgered into going out and saying, hey, can you scan this code and do this thing? Um, and they just wanted me to get out of their face, so they did. They didn't necessarily give me um, a zip code. But there is additional information on the final report in the appendices. You can see a little bit more information in regard to that. But again, it's not specific to the city. OK, well, it doesn't have everything, but I'm really happy. <laughs> that we're on that path. So um, I'll keep on talking about it and we'll keep on doing stuff and uh, eventually we'll get there. So thank you for the presentation. Thank you to the uh, consultants too as well uh, and talking about all the subjects that we had on this uh, evening. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Okay, thank you for the presentation and I think that uh, you've shown that people can say there's always something to do in Elgin and the young people can't say that there's nothing to do, Dad. But <laughs> There is. There's plenty of things. I entertain a motion to adjourn for five minutes so and uh, reconvene Second. at the regular council meeting. Second. Been moved and second to adjourn. Court, please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we are adjourned. We'll reconvene.
Council for April 10th, 2024 to order. Will the, uh, please join me in the Pledge of Allegiance, if you will. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Okay. Will the clerk please call the roll? Councilmember Dixon. Present. Good. Here. Martinez. Here. Ortiz. Here. Powell. Here. Rauschenberger. Here. Stephan. Here. Thorne. Here. Mayor Captain. Here. Approval of the minutes of the previous meeting of March 20th, 2024. Move so for moved. approval. Second. Been moved and second for approval. Any corrections or additions? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Uh, the, uh, the motion is approved, and we have uh, four communications this evening. Will Matt assist? Help me with the name. <laughs> <laughs> join, join, me, join me at the podium, the Chief Lowell. Whereas the National Animal Care and Control Association designated the second full week of April as National Animal Care and Control Appreciation Week, and whereas the federal, state, local government officials throughout the country take this time to recognize, thank, and commend all animal control officers and animal service staff for the dedicated service they provide to the citizens, public safety, and domestic animals and livestock across the nation, and whereas every day animal control officers and animal control technicians put themselves in potentially dang dangerous situations to protect the health and welfare of all kinds of animals and the public, and whereas Elgin recognizes and commends the animal control division personnel who answer calls for assistance, capture roaming and potentially dangerous animals, rescue animals, investigate reports of animal abuse, educate pet owners and resp with, about responsible care, excuse me, and, med and mediate disputes between neighbors regarding pets. Now, therefore, I, David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, Illinois, do hereby proclaim the week of April 14th to the 20th as Animal Con Care and Control Appreciation Week and encourage all citizens to join us in expressing their sincere appreciation for the service and dedication of our animal control employees. Matt, congratulations. Thank you very much. I uh, just want to say thank you. I, it's, I've been very blessed to work 20 years now in such a, uh, for such a wonderful department that's supportive and a great community. I appreciate this. Thank you. Okay, the next one, um, Victoria Gajewski. Is she here? Here she comes. Okay. Ms. Williams. Whereas each day thousands of Americans dial 911 for help in emergencies and the men and women who answer these calls for help, gathering essential information and dispatching the appropriate assistance can often make the difference between life and death for persons in need. And whereas the City of Elgin's public safety telecommunicators are among the more than 200,000 telecommunicators specialists who work daily to protect and to promote public safety, and whereas public safety telecommunications are more than a common reassuring voice at the other end of the phone, they are knowledgeable and highly trained individuals who not only work closely with the police and fire departments, but numerous other state and local agencies, as well as other departments within the city. And whereas, because emergencies can strike at any time, we will rely on the vigilance and the preparedness of these individuals 24 hours a day, 365 days a year. And whereas the City of Elgin recognizes the need to maintain the highest standard of public safety, 
We owe great debt to the men and women who, by applying their expertise in telecommunications, helped to make the achievements possible. Now, therefore, I, David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, Illinois, on behalf of the entire city, council, city council staff, do hereby proclaim April 14th to the 20th as National Public Safety Telecommunications Week, and we acknowledge that debt of appreciation and extend a heartfelt thank you to each of you. My name is Victoria. I've been with the city for almost 17 years now working in the 911 Center. Um, I really appreciate all the support that um, Elgin continues to show all of us. We're really blessed to serve you. This is my partner, Kayla, who just celebrated her one year. Walter Shales, you come up. <laughs> you can all come up if you want. I want to get a picture. Okay, yep, that's fine. Whereas Walter Shales was born on April 19th, 1924 at home on Mill Street in Elgin. And whereas Walter was the second of seven children born to Glenn and Ida Shales, who all grew up on Slop Hill in Elgin, Whereas Walter was drafted into the U.S. Army in 1943, served in World War II as Staff Sergeant until 1946, at which time he fought in the Pacific. Whereas after returning from the war, Walter uh, purchased four empty lots on the corner of Demond and North Alfred Street in Elgin. He built his own home where he raised his three children, Walter Jr., Cindy, and Kim, Whereas Walter started working in 1947 for Anderson Roofing in Elgin and then Lamp Construction before starting his own roofing business. Whereas, except for the three-year Pacific tour, Walter has lived his entire 100 years in Elgin, has grandchildren and one great-grandson. Whereas on April 19th, 2024, Walter will celebrate his 100th birthday. Now, therefore, I, David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, Illinois, do hereby honor Walter Shales for 100 years in the City of Elgin and wish him a very happy birthday. Congratulations. John Duffy, please come up. <laughs> Whereas John Duffy has proudly served the Elgin community for over 40 years from a multitude of directions, beginning in 1962 at Larkin High School teaching English, and in 1977 also Latin, then in 1975 began the start of the 48-year journey on the, El uh, on the Elgin Community College School, uh, School Board of Trustees. And whereas John has served Elgin on various teacher boards and associations, including the Elgin Teachers Association as welfare chairman and chief negotiator, 
eventually president, president of the Illinois Association of Legislator and Chairman, the Asso American Association of Community Colleges Board of Directors, past president and board member of Elgin Area Catholic Social Services, member of the St. Lawrence Parish Board, and the Board of Joint Commission on Federal Legislation. And whereas John Duffy retired in 1966 from his pre uh, teaching position at Larkin High School and has since retired in 2023 from his trustee position at Elgin Community College, Elgin Community College has honored John Duffy's service with a street, Duffy Drive, and also the establishment of a scholarship in his name. And whereas the city of Elgin recognizes and commends John Duffy for contributing his time and expertise to our Elgin community, his high level of personal achievement, leadership, and dedication serves as an example to all. As a foundation which we can encourage others to desire a feeling of personal ownership, self-investment, and pride in their communities. Now, therefore, I, David Captain, Mayor of the City of Elgin, Illinois, do hereby invite all citizens to join in expressing their sincere and com their sincere appreciation and commendation for John Duffy, recognizing his outstanding career achievements and truly exemplifying the honor and value of service to our Elgin community. John, great job. <laughs> Before I, before I start my before I start my remarks, I'd like to acknowledge the fact that four of my former Larkin High School Latin students are here in the room: <laughs> Councilman John Stephan, yeah. Andre, Andrea, and Russ Fiebig as well. I can get this open. Okay. In one of his more famous speeches, President John F. Kennedy once said, ask not what your country can do for you, ask rather what you can do for your country. Some six years earlier, in 1956, I graduated from Loris College with a major in philosophy and minors in Latin and English. Our graduation speaker was a young U.S. senator named John F. Kennedy. In his speech, he quoted Plato and Aristotle and St. Thomas Aquinas, which gave us philosophy majors some warm, fuzzy feelings. But the whole speech was both inspirational and motivational. It was a long-winded version of Ask Not What Your Country Can Do For You, ask rather what you can do for your country. Actually, the inspirational part was already in me. JFK had just reinforced in his speech what 16 years of Catholic education had already instilled in me. The motivational part, not so much, because I am and always have been an introvert. And introverts, by nature, do not like to do what I am doing right now. <laughs> they need a push or two. Tonight's push was the proclamation just read. When Ann and I came to Elgin in 1962, I had already taught for five years in Iowa. So we wanted to find out fast whether this was the place where we wanted to spend the rest of our lives. To do that, I immediately became active in the Elgin Teachers Association's Welfare Committee because that's where the action was. Within a year, the Elgin teachers had become my motivational push, and that part of my life was on the fast track. A few years later, after Sunday Mass at St. Lawrence, an usher approached me and asked if I had listened to the gospel. He asked if I had heard the part about burying one's talents. He said that that was what I had been doing, 
and that I needed to run for the open position on the St. Lawrence Parish Education Committee. He was that motivational push, and suddenly that part of my life was on the fast track. In 1975, Chuck Medeiros, who had been my boss at Larkin and was then a dean at Elgin Community College, along with four faculty members, sat in our living room and urged me to run for the ECC Board of Trustees. I said no. I said the election was during spring break and that Ann and I were taking our four children to Biloxi to camp on the Gulf for spring break. They said, what if we ran the campaign for you? I said, okay, I guess. <laughs> we came back from spring break to learn that I had been elected to the Elgin Community College <laughs> Board of Trustees. <clears throat> and that board itself proved to be its own motivational push for me. I never counted the years I spent at St. Lawrence Parish activities, but I knew know that I spent 34 years at Larkin High School and 48 years in the Elgin Community College Board of Trustees. Do I have any regrets? Yes, I do. I wish I had spent more time with my children while they were growing up. Billy Dean has a song called, Everything That Glitters Is Not Gold. In that song is this line, for everything you gain, there's something lost. I have thought about that line a lot. Am I glad I did what I did? Yes, I am. I think I did some good along the way, and somebody needed to do it. But in the back of my mind is Billy Dean's line, for everything you gain, there's something lost. Thank you for this honor. I will cherish it for the rest of my life. We have a few people have signed up to speak uh, for a couple minutes about uh, items on the agenda and not on the agenda. First person to sign up is Marcus Banner. Good evening, Mayor, City Council. I'm Marcus Banner, the People's Champ. And I come to you as one, one people, one voice, one community. I'm here tonight to make it clear how very disappointed our forgotten communities are that our council approved the Citizens Review Board in its current form. We are even more disappointed in the fact that members whom we thought would represent the best interests of our forgotten communities sold us out. Start, stating their reasons for accepting useless policies that don't protect or give any power back to the community's hurt is because of current laws and agreements that create obstacles that discourage them from getting what we need. I say to them, the only thing preventing us from being protected by unjust policies is their lack of courage and willingness to fight for what is necessary. The 1965 Voting Rights Act, gutted. Roe v. Wade, overturned. 
Our city is currently changing policies because of how the Supreme Court ruled on affirmative action in college admissions. So the problem isn't the laws on the books. The problem is the only people with any fire inside of them to fight are people who are fighting to make America great by rolling back policies to the early 1900s. The problem is our representatives with the power and titles to change the laws, preventing us from having proper policies in place that truly protect the people being victimized, don't have the courage, willingness, or desire to engage in the hard fight to do the right thing. They are too busy chasing political trophies and pounding their chests about how they get things done. Even though what they are getting done has absolutely no substance, hasn't created any meaningful change, or protected those who have been traumatized by bad laws and agreements in place. So to those in office afraid to challenge laws, police unions, and lack the desire for the hard fight, as well as are content with just getting things done, regardless or not having any useful application, please, just get out of the way for those of us who will match the fighting spirit of the opposition with a greater fire, desire, and courage to use our power titles to fight for real life change in policies with real substance that would truly uplift and protect our forgotten communities. Now, I'll leave you as I always come as one people, one voice, one community. Thank you. Thank you. Ron Milner. Captain, council members, citizens of Elgin. My name is Ron Milner. I'm a former resident of Elgin. I lived here for 20 years from 1986 to 2006. I currently live in the town of Sycamore, and I come back to Elgin to help the citizens better manage their money. I've been working uh, with some organizations in Elgin right now, and I promised the mayor that I will come back on an infrequent basis and update the council as to my uh, progress. It's important that everyone knows how financial literacy works. When I was in school, I was never given a course in financial literacy. My parents didn't know anything about financial <coughs> literacy. And I decided to go to the school of hard knocks to learn financial literacy. And it's very expensive, but the lesson you'll never forget. <laughs> so I'm calling upon this community to reach out to me like I'm reaching out to you right now and help me help these young minority students, black and Hispanic and white, because we're all in this together. And I appreciate this council and this town. I, the love that I've been shown in this city, it, it breaks my heart. It's just beautiful. And so I want us to work together. Even though I'm an outsider now, I'm on the inside and I want to help people. We're working with organizations such as Brothers Rise Up, which is uh, run by Mr. James Cook. He's phenomenal. He reached out to me, and he said, Ron, you're helping change lives. I've gone to three middle schools with him, and the students are, were blown away by what I know. So I'm going to continue to reach out to everyone here. I need help. I'm just me and my partner and a few other people. We're a small group, and uh, we want to help. Elgin means a lot to me. I bought my first house as an adult. And um, I think our subject that we have, financial literacy, can help everyone. On a lighter note, Council <coughs> Member Powell, you mentioned Prince. In 1984, I got my wife four tickets to see Prince live, and she took her girlfriends, and she had a fantastic time. So I <laughs> salute you there. <laughs> and um, it's just phenomenal. Like I said, we're all one people. Uh, I love everyone. I'm here to help. I have some knowledge, and what we're asking for from the citizens of Elgin and the council members is we want to be able to bring our services here at a price. Now, when we last appeared here, we did a workshop with the uh, African American Coalition of Kane County and the YWCA. The attendees loved it. Uh, we left 15% of our proceeds with that group because we want that money to circulate throughout the, the city of Elgin. So like I say, we're not here for money, we're here for help. Help us, help your students, and Elgin can be a better city. And I'm gonna leave some information with the uh, clerk here, if she can pass it out. Thank you very much. So everyone has a copy. Like I said, I'll, I'll update the council members when I can. 
Uh, I thank you for this opportunity. I thank you for your time, and God bless you. Thank, thank you. you. We had a, a couple of residents had signed up for uh, items on the agenda. I'll give you the choice if you'd like to speak now, uh, maybe some time before we get back to your items, and uh, we'll leave it to you. Uh, the first ones that signed up, Heather Wicker and Rebecca Cody. Good evening and thank you for your time. Um, we are here to bring up some concerns that we have as residents of Randall Ridge in the development from Long Common on to Coombs and the, um, proposed yeah, the proposed project that is, I guess, temporary. And we were having some questions about the concerns of the backed up traffic, the amount of accidents that are getting in and out of our uh, subdivision, the difficulty getting in and out of our subdivision and the money that is being used for this temporary fix could possibly be used in another way to provide a sidewalk or an overpass for our children to be able to get out of our neighborhood safely because as it is right now there is no option yeah. um the left hand turn lane if you're going west on 20th and the left hand turn lane to go into common i don't understand why it could not just be blocked off so we could possibly turn left in there and just wait march. Yeah, as a merge or just wait for a median for the oncoming traffic to clear and use that money for the Michigan U-turn to provide a sidewalk for our children to get out of that neighborhood. Anything else you want to add? Um, yeah, I feel like I feel like this Michigan left turn or U-turn, whatever you want to call it, would cause more problems and more traffic buildup. Um, I don't, I don't really understand how this is going to work or make anything better. It makes it harder for us to get out and or to get out into the other neighborhoods. I mean, it's already really difficult, but suggesting um, the left-hand turn to turn into Providence, instead of allowing people to turn left there, just blocking it off, making it a median so that we can exit our subdivision into the median and then safely cross into onto 20 to go east would make more sense and then utilize the money to make an overpass for people to walk into the next subdivision or build a sidewalk down to Nestler so we can walk down to the light safely. Um, otherwise, we're kind of a little island. We can't get out of our subdivision ever. It's the too only, busy. Go I mean, all, all the people that are moving to Hampshire, Pingree Grove, we have triple the traffic that we than we did, what, 10 years ago when we moved in? Mm -hmm. So It was much less traffic when we moved in, and it's just going to get worse with all of the yeah. development of the communities that are going on into Pingree Grove. And it's just, I understand that this Michigan thing is a temporary fix, but this left-hand turn lane into Providence can also be a temporary fix until a longer term. And I mean, as it stands right now, our only exit and entrance to our subdivision is via Randall Road or 20. And they're both extremely busy in the growth of our community. And it's, it's just very difficult for us. Our kids are, we're all stuck. We're stuck there. There's not even a bus stop for our kids to travel down to McDonald's to get a job. Yeah. And it, I mean, Country Donuts hires kids. I mean, there's plenty of opportunities for our children to get jobs and to become a providing member of this community and be, oh, oh. oh. Okay. thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I could go on, but <laughs> thank you for your time. <laughs> uh, Mr. Pubins is in the back and I think you may have met him. Uh, yes. We did, yes. Okay, <laughs> and he uh, will answer questions for you and your neighbors if there's uh, uh, things that you'd like to pursue. Okay. Thank you very much for your time. Hey, Carrie Kelly, you signed up for uh, Side Street if you'd like to speak now or wait till we get back to it. <laughs> but I'm Carrie Kelly. Thanks so much for the opportunity to, to speak to you and to address you. Um, I strongly support awarding Side Street Studio Arts um, their zoning approval as well as their TIF funds. Um, Aaron and Tanner are two of the most hardworking, creative, generous, resourceful people in all of Elgin. Um, Side Street Studio Arts, um, they create excitement and fun that bring people downtown, that make people want to live downtown. And that's what we need more of. And that's what we also need for a successful riverfront, North Grove Redevelopment. Would also be, they would be a key player in that because they're one of the few entities that are capable 
of offering all kinds of attractions throughout the week. You always need to have something happening during the week for people to come down and to want to live and, and recreate here. So I really think they're a key to the riverfront development here. And we're also very lucky that they chose Elgin. So um, I hope we can show our appreciation and do everything we can to keep them here. Thanks. Thank you. Okay, that brings us to bids. The first item is bid number 24-01, uh, golf course uh, landscaping supplies. Mr. Mayor, I recommend that we award golf course, sports complex, and forestry landscaping supply bid to the lowest responsive bidders and the total amount of $172,313. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Just, Mr. Just Staff. quickly, I, I, I want to take an opportunity to um, just uh, reinforce, I think, something that comes from Sustainability Commission, and I think Carol, I'll, I'll believe Carol of this, because I think it's a broken record for you, and you, yeah. you always have to make these, but um, Brad and Mike and, and the golf uh, operations department, um, you know, the, the more that we can look at organics, the more that we can get away from the uh, really dangerous chemicals. I just want to reinforce that. I know you do that. I know you look at it. Um, I know we're always trying to move away from the traditional herbicides and pesticides and get to more natural and organic stuff. And I just want to reinforce that uh, from the from the dais. So that's my comment. Anything else? Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorn? Yes. Chair Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. <clears throat> uh, item 2 is bid number 24 019, lead service line replacement contract. Mr. May, I'll, I'll make the motion that we award this uh, bid to IHC Construction Companies LLC. In the amount of six hundred eighty-five thousand nine hundred sixty-four dollars. Second. Been moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none. Court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon. Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Ortiz. Yes. Powell. Yes. Rauschenberger. Yes. Stefan. Yes. Thorn. Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes. Motions approved nine zero. <clears throat> Item three is uh, bid number. 24-020, uh, repair and resurface uh, various basketball and tennis courts. Move toward the contract to Evans & Sons Blacktop of West Chicago for repairs and resurfacing of basketball courts at Wing Park Tennis Court, Wing Park and Tennis Courts at Lord's Park for $141,426. Move for approval. Second. Been moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. <coughs> Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item 4 is bid number 24 023, uh, 2024 pool chemicals. Well, I'll, move <clears throat> I'll move that we award this to Allergen Supply Company. Um, them in the amount of $29,400 and Imperial Lubes and Supply LLC in the amount of $30,620, um, totaling $60,020. Second. And moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, Kirk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motion is approved 9 0. Item uh, five is a bid number 24-023, request for qualifications, Portland cement uh, concrete. <clears throat> Mr. May, I'll make the motion to award this bid to a Zinga ready mix concrete in an amount not to exceed $100,000. Second. Move the second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item 6 is bid number 24 024 LED lights for Lord's Park. Uh, uh, <coughs> Mr. Mayor, I recommend that we award this contract to Steiner Electric Company in the amount of $49,980. Second. 
It's moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Steff. Uh, again, just a quick shout out to Greg and Maria in Public Works. Uh, I assume that Aaron Neal also had a hand in this because it's LED related. But I just appreciate <coughs> the way they went out and aggressively looked at a way to get LED lights into parts of our city. And I hope that effort continues. So I appreciate it. That's all. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motion's approved 9 0. Item 7 is a bid for. Item 7 is a bid 24 025A. Oops, I'm sorry. I got out of step here. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there we go. The bid is uh, 24 024 bituminous asphalt. <coughs> I'll move that we award this in an amount not to exceed 320000 from multiple vendors uh, being Plody, Superior, and that will be in accordance with the IDOT regulations. Second. It's been moved to second for approval. Any discussion? <clears throat> Hearing none, court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? I see. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 9 0. Item 8 is bid number 24 025A, Central Business District Contractual Landscape Maintenance. <clears throat> Move to award the contract to Cornerstone Partners Horticultural Services for landscaping services in the amount of $189,723. Second. second. Move to the second for approval. Any discussion? Ms. Uh, Rauschenberger? You know, just a question. We didn't have any um, Elgin um, companies bid on this. Which I don't immediately know, uh, re recall whether it was Elgin companies, but uh, this was this is similar to the issue that we had last year where we had some problems with the bidding, but we made sure that we did it correctly this year. Okay. And it's it's the same vendor that uh, that was originally awarded the oh. contract last year and then came back to complete. Okay. So complete it, it's just one of those. You know, if we can look for Elgin <coughs> vendors, we have lots of people in Elgin that do horticulture services. Uh, agreed. But agreed, yeah. But unfortunately, this is a competitive bid, so even if there were Elgin vendors competing, we're obligated to go with the lowest cost for the services. So. Oh, okay, thanks. Anything else? Court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item 9 is bid number 24 028, special events portable sound systems. I will move that we award this to Washington Music Sales Center in the amount of $33,624. Second. second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motion's approved 9 0. Item 10 is bid of a Microsoft Enterprise Software License Subscription Renewal through a state contract joint purchasing agreement. Mr. Mr. Mayor, I recommend we award this to Dell the amount of 262966 annually for a three year term. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motion's approved 9 0. Brings us to other business. First item is consideration of petition 32 23, uh, 62 South Grove Avenue, conditional use of, for a planned development for the adaptive reuse of an existing 6,000 square foot building as an art center for Side Street Studio Arts nonprofit organization. Mr. Malott. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. This property is located between Grove Avenue and Riverside Drive, north of Fulton Street. Here is Grove, this is Riverside Drive, this is Spring, and this is Fulton. El Patio is here, the under construction DuPage Court is here, Chamber of Commerce here, 
40 to page court. This is art space and this is all the public parking in one form or another. Side Street Studio Arts proposes the adaptive reuse of the existing three-story building at 62 South Grove for art program, exhibition, events, and classes. The building has been vacant since 2002. Side Street plans to renovate the building in two phases. Phase one would establish the main gallery and exhibition space on the first floor along with new ADA compliant restrooms. It would include establishing a code compliant second entrance from Riverside Drive, restoring the boarded up windows, installing a new elevator, constructing code compliant exiting stairs, and updating all building systems including electrical, plumbing, HVAC, and fire suppression. Mm -hmm. Phase one would also include restoring and enhancing the front of Grove. The lower level and second floor would not be occupied during phase one. Phase two would expand first floor offerings by adding a meeting room, retail space, lobby, and reception area. The second floor would be built out with additional gallery and exhibition space, offices, a multi-purpose meeting room, and ADA compliant bathrooms. The lower level would be built out with classroom space, a dark room, screen printing room, and storage. Phase two also includes a complete renovation of the Riverside Drive facade featuring large windows and new signage. The renovation would allow Side Street to consolidate its operation that currently across four different locations into one facility. The building would also be available for rent for various events similar to other downtown event venues. The applicant is present should you have any questions. Staff in the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval. Subject to the conditions outlined within your packet. Move for approval subject to the conditions. It's been moved and second for approval. Any discussion or questions for Mr. Malat? Mr. Ortiz. Oh, thank you. Thank you for this and thank you to Aaron and Tanner for uh, getting this project going. I just want to bring up that uh, I asked about the asbestos removal to uh, Mr. Malat and the city manager and I, I'm assuming you guys gave the documentation so I appreciate it uh, that you guys did it and then thanks to the Reva and Dave Logan Foundation for also help funding that and getting that done so thank you for keeping your building healthy and safe. You went down this way. Ms. Powell. Thank you. Um, first, I'd like to say how excited I am to see this project come forward. I love, love the <laughs> signage, um, especially the signage um, along Riverside Drive. We've made some significant investments in the promenade, um, but unfortunately, I haven't seen a whole lot of folks really take advantage of that as we would like to with the business owners down there. So, I, But I really think that this is a, um, a catalyst to see that change um, with the signage. So um, I had the opportunity to tour the building uh, with, with Aaron recently. Never would have thought that space was that huge on the inside. Um, it's a, a hidden gem in our downtown. Um, looking forward to seeing this redevelop. The fact that it's been vacant now for over 20 years is just, it, it, it's mind boggling. Um, but I'll, I'll save some of my other comments for another portion of the, of the discussion, but definitely we'll be um, voting in favor of this. Anything else? Ms. Rushenberg. Yeah. Uh, I will also say um, what a wonderful use um, for that building and I'm glad it's as big as it is because I know you'll do wonderful things in all of the square feet that you have um, and uh, you know you've, you've worked your magic for 10 years and I see that Aaron and Tanner and all of Side Street Studio Arts will continue to do that so um, I'm very supportive. Okay. Anything else? No comments. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Let's see. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motion's approved 9 0. Brings us to item two is consideration of petition 01 24 455 Shepherd Drive. Conditional use for a planned development for an adaptive reuse of an existing 20,000 square foot light industrial building as a motor vehicle collision repair shop. 
Move for approval. Oh, shit. Sorry. Thank you, <laughs> Mr. Mayor. This property is located along the east side of Shepherd Drive between Fleetwood Drive and Berkeley Street, south and west of the U.S. Route 20 and McLean Boulevard intersection. Route 20 is here. This is McLean. Take Fleetwood to Shepherd, and this is Berkeley. This is the Wendy's, the Shell Circle, K, gas station and convenience store are here, and this is Elgin Lanes. Caliber Collision requests approval of a motor vehicle collision repair center within the existing building at 455 Shepherd Drive. The repair center would be corporate owned and operated by Caliber Collision with services limited to collision repair arranged through agreements with insurance companies. Caliber Collision would invest approximately $1 million to renovate the 19,500 square foot light industrial building. The two loading docks and doors and driveway and curb cut in front of the building would be removed. The entire building would be freshly painted. Caliber Collision would install a public sidewalk along Shepherd Drive and extensive landscaping along the perimeter of the property and where the front uh, loading dock uh, was removed and where very little exists today. The building would have a small office and lobby area at the front with 16 interior repair bays, including two paint booths. Damaged vehicles will be dropped off at the back of the building before being brought inside via two rear or red doors. All repair activity would be conducted inside the building. So it would be open 7.30 to 5.30 Monday through Friday and employ 16 people. The applicant is present. Should you have any questions, staff and the Planning and Zoning Commission recommend approval subject to conditions outlined within your packet. Move I'll for approval. Motion. Move subject for approval. to conditions. Second. It's been moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. Again, this is the second one back to back that has conditional use for planned development. I love when that happens, you know, <laughs> that it's uh, conditional use and it's something that's already planned. And um, I understand that one of the people that is here is from Elgin. Yes, and I thank you for coming back and um, using your money here in Elgin, that you believe in Elgin, and um, that um, to hear all your comments that you had about Elgin, that was kind of neat to hear. So I just wanted to say thank you. Mm -hmm. okay. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. The motion is approved 9-0. Item 3 is a resolution authorizing execution of an agreement with Hampton, Lanzini, and Renwick for professional services in connection with the, the uh, public EV charging station project. Move for approval. Second. second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? No. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 8-1. Item four is a resolution authorizing execution of a 2024 agreement with the Kane County Child Advocacy Center by and through the Kane County State's Attorney's State's Attorney for funding assistance relating to the investigation of sensitive crimes involving children. Move for approval. Second. 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 Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Abstain. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. The motion is approved 8 0 with one abstention. Item 5 is a resolution authorizing the execution of a sales agreement with the City of DeKalb for the sale of surplus emergency uh, portable radios. Move for approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion's approved 9 0. Item 6 is a resolution authorizing execution of a sales agreement with the Samanoff Community Fire Protection District for the sale of surplus emergency radios. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, motion's approved 9-0. Consent agenda. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorn? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Miscellaneous business. Move for approval. Second. second. Moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, the motion is approved 9 0. Announcements the next committee of the whole meeting will be Wednesday, April 24th, 2024, at 6 p.m. in the City Council Chambers. The next regular meeting of the Elgin City Council will be Wednesday, April 24th, 2024, at 7 p.m. in the Council Chambers. I'd entertain a motion to adjourn back to the committee of the whole. So moved. Second. second. Moved and second to adjourn. Court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we are adjourned. Brings us back to the uh, uh, council meeting. Entertain a motion to reconvene. So moved. Second. Moved and seconded. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we're back in business. I believe we're on item B. Agreed, Mayor. Thank you. Skyworks Drone Shows agreement for the end of summer bash event. Uh, Skyworks Drone Shows has been selected due to its cost per drone, amount of drones available, and the level of service which it can provide. Skyworks Drone Shows has for many years, uh, has many years of experience and regularly does work of this nature for large scale events including partners such as Disney, McDonald's, and FIFA. Skyworks, as Amanda highlighted earlier, will be providing a 10 to 15 minute drone show taking off from various sites for optimal attendee views. The show consists of 300 drones operating in a synchronized and programmed show, doubling the programming that took place in 2023. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Ms. Paul. Yes, I know that um, the other vendor was here and brought up some issues. I just wanted to see if staff wanted to address any of those, or is there any difference in what they were proposing versus who we're recommending in terms of their capabilities? I mean, I'd be more than happy to reach out to the to the vendor that was here and have that conversation, but the, the okay. proposals were comparable, absolutely okay. comparable. Um, ultimately, Skyworks, as, as the city manager noted, uh, was able to provide the level of service that we were looking for. The, the proposals were also vetted by our fire department to make sure that they did meet the safety requirements necessary. Thank you. Okay. That's all I have. Thanks. Okay. Anything else? Court, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes, the motion's approved 9-0. Item C is the commissioned work of art agreement with Eric Dowdle. El Elgin's rich artistic culture and profound historical appreciation make it the ideal community for the Eric Dowdle Land That I Love Tour celebrating America's 250th birthday in 2026. This nationwide tour will be highlighting cities across the country with Elgin being the first city in Illinois to embrace this prestigious celebration. Renowned artist Eric Dowdle will be visiting Elgin as part of the tour, immersing himself in the community, exploring its history, and creating an original artwork. An unveiling event will occur once that art is done to celebrate its completion. The artwork will then be transformed into limited edition puzzles and gicles sold nationwide. Staff recommends an agreement not exceeding $120,000 for Eric Dowdle to create this original artwork, puzzles and gicles, showcasing Elgin's cultural richness on a national scale. Move for approval. Second. It's moved to second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz. Uh, I have one for Ms. Harris. So I seen in your presentation earlier of the picture you showed, I had whatever council was hidden inside that picture. <laughs> so if you decide to put us in there for 120000 I hope you do. But if you do, make sure you get my good side. I have my hat on. Let's Got go. it. Yeah. Right. I would, if it wasn't the hat, no one would think it was you. So. Okay. As long, as long as we're on the same page. All right, thanks. Anything else? Ms. Rauschenberger. Um, yes. I uh, looked up uh, Mr. Eric Dowdle because I'd never heard of him. And um, 
I see that he does some sort of, and I would ask people in the, uh, if you have your phone to look him up. He does these sort of interesting folk art, but I feel like it's very, um, it's not artistic as it is commercial, commercialized. Um, for example, one of his famous um, paintings is the inside of a Costco because Costco sells his um, artwork uh, puzzles. And I just feel for the amount of $120,000 that we could have something um, that gets people to our community. Um, I, I'm guessing for this 120, and there was a comment when I asked some people in the audience if they knew, and they said, if uh, uh, for $120,000, I should have heard of this artist by now. <laughs> so I feel like it's, I don't know if we're getting a kickback on the puzzles that we're supposedly selling. If you think that puzzles sold in Costco's around the country will make people want to come to Elgin. Um, I just don't see how this, or, or are there many people in Elgin that are gonna buy these puzzles and give them away? I, I just, I, I see it as no legs. Let's say there's no legs to this project. It's just like a, maybe go to Costco and buy the puzzle. <laughs> so that's my feeling about it. Um, uh, and, and I just think for, if this was $20,000, go for it. But $120,000 that could be put toward, I think, some fabulous, you know, uh, art, you know, project, an outdoor art project that we could have in Elgin for three months and people would come, or that we could get, uh, you know, some famous person for the ESO. So, and I understand this amount does not come out of, um, I thought it came out of the, the, uh, the commission, the Arts Commission. Um, but it is not out of the Arts Commission. Out of events, the, the It's money. out of the general fund, I believe. Out of the general here. fund. Mm -hmm. So uh, that's my big concern. Again, he, he, the, the painting that you get is gonna be about this big, the size of a puzzle. So I guess that'll probably go in Rick's office. <laughs> and um, no legs. <laughs> you know what? People will say Elgin, Illinois, but this guy also has 400 other communities that he has puzzles for, and I'm, I'm not sure that people buy a puzzle and then decide to, to venture into Elgin or, or, you know, Portland or, you know, wherever else is. Uh. So that's my feeling about it. For the price, uh, um, I don't think we are getting enough. If I could, I just wanted to note too yes. that, that the reason that we did go with the not to exceed amount is because staff is gonna look to work with partners and, and, and local businesses and, and nonprofits and whomever that may want to help throw into this uh, pile. Additionally, this doesn't include, this assumes that the city is, is not making a return on any of this. Um, in reality, staff anticipates a 30 to 40% reduction in that cost once we make the money back from some of those puzzle sales as well as sponsorship opportunities. So that is just a piece that's out there. And another piece is the eight by 10 interactive puzzle wall that we'll keep um, that will stay here, but that will have to be an indoor piece. Okay, anything else? Council, anything else? Ms. Paul. So is there a portion of the proceeds from the puzzle sales that will come directly back to the city? I'm It'll assuming. be a combo platter of things that we have to work out with local partners. Typically how communities do this is they work with their local chambers, they work with local retailers to sell, to sell the puzzle um, at the wholesale cost, which is $12.50 per. Um, retail cost is $24, so it is a 100% markup. Um, what their company, what the Dowdle company has recommended is that we keep with that, that strategy. Um, and then that additional, that money that we would be making back would cover the cost that the city would be putting out. Um, none of those contracts or conversations have yet happened. Would there also be opportunities to purchase like a pitcher yep. or, okay. Yeah, one of the things is for the, the that we contemplated is we get a one year, um, we're the only people that get to use any of this output and we also get the wholesale pricing for a year. So if we did decide to do a large scale version of this or order more or whatever it is that we want, um, we do have that one year 
uh, Monopoly. So you wouldn't be able to buy this puzzle or this piece or any other version of this artwork anywhere else but through our selected retailers. But say we wanted to turn it into a mural, mm -hmm. we would still have to pay to get the mural done. Yes. Obviously. Mm -hmm. um, I struggle with this. I know that this is not coming from the Cultural Arts Commission, but it was reviewed with the Cultural Art Com Arts Commission. Mm -hmm. um, I missed that meeting this week. Sorry, I had to work. Um, but it sounds like that there was a favorable response but it wasn't officially voted on. No, no. Instead, it was because this was not part of the Cultural Arts Commission, but I'm the staff liaison to that commission. Um, I do still report out on all cultural arts and special events activities. Um, and with consideration to the uh, cultural arts and special events strategic plan that we previewed and the desire for more public art, that's why this uh, was, was brought in front of them for review. Right. And I know that just being the liaison to the Cultural Arts Commission, as we've looked to acquire more permanent art in the community, like some of the, um, the sculptures that were um, commissioned for a certain period of time, and we've since purchased some of those, um, and we're looking to do more of that in the future. Um, I, personally, I would actually rather see us take this money and do something like that with it than what's being proposed here. Um, and that's rare, I kind of deviate from, you know, what the Cultural Arts Commission and, and staff in this area um, has typically recommended, but I, I know how expensive some of those art pieces are that we've looked at and those sculptures. Um, but I, if I'm gonna spend this much money I don't want it to be on a puzzle. I don't even know how many people actually still do puzzles nowadays. I have but one in my office. Uh, you're different. No. <laughs> you're different. <laughs> but I'd, I'd rather see us invest in more tangible art work in our downtown and um, in some of the areas that we've, that we've identified. I think that would be a better use of the funding. That would just be my, that's my thought. That's my feeling. Thank you. Anything else? Mr. Dixon. I still do puzzles with my kids. You're different, too. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I actually, I think this is a really great idea. Let me tell you why. Um, when I travel, if I'm in a vehicle, car, you know, I'm driving through the state, you know, maybe other states or whatever, and I'm stopping in some of these other communities, and I've seen this idea before. And so in the back of my mind, I've always thought to myself, it would be great if Elgin had something like this. And so it's a great way. It's a, it's a memorabilia type of a piece. And so and I think it gains value over time. Um, and with, when I'm with my children, um, my kids, I have them do puzzles to get them off of the iPad, to get them off of the phone. It makes them, you know, think a little bit more analytically about, you know, um, the steps in the process. So I still enjoy that kind of stuff uh, in doing it with them. So I'm going to support this. Uh, it is a little pricey, uh, but you talked about making some of this money back because it's a 100% markup. Can you, <clears throat> my, my only question is, you know, do we have an estimate of, you know, of how much we plan to uh, recoup off of this? Um, you know, or is, that, is this not, you know, that type of situation? I mean, this is certainly assuming that the city take take the risk with this not to exceed plan. Um, but based on conversations with Eric Dowdle and knowing the community's response to the history that is here and wanting to celebrate that, um, we anticipate somewhere between 30 to 40 percent of that 120 to come back. To come back, okay, all right, and that's a lot more. That's a lot more comfortable of a number, you know. And I know that's just an estimate, um, but. You know, if it doesn't make that and it's 20,000 or, you know, you know, 30,000, I'm a lot happier the less that we ended up actually uh, losing out on this. So, so great job again. Thank you. Mr. Ortiz. All right, one last one. Uh, I remember probably like 10 years ago when Monopoly made those city versions and Elgin had one. Did the city help? make that Elgin Monopoly game or did Hasbro just come in and make that? You know, I haven't the foggiest idea. Um, I would have to get back to you on that. Okay. All right. That's it. Uh, 
Yeah, that was before my time. I don't know if this is a manager. I have one if you'd like to see it. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> I think I've got one in my office. All right, thanks. I was wondering if Elgin had any say so in how that game was made. Mm -mm. All right, thanks. Not, not me. Okay, anything else? Mr. Stephan. Amanda, I, uh, just a quick question because I'm not clear so far. Maybe you can help me. The, the not to exceed $120,000, that's not because the artist fee is yet to be negotiated. He's kind of set a price. That's only because we might recoup some of it? Through. That's correct. Okay. All right. That's what I needed to hear. What is his price? Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. I kind of was on the fence on this one because it does seem like it's pretty pricey. But um, I know that... Um, as somebody just mentioned, uh, the price, but uh, I agree. I think that when the family gets together and works on something, it's, it's priceless. And um, I believe that puzzles are, um, you'd be surprised at how many uh, different people work on puzzles um, and how many people that have moved away from Elgin appreciate stuff from Elgin. And I think that something that might be very resourceful for uh, the history of Elgin, I think that um, they would appreciate it as well. And um, I believe that we would recoup a lot more than what you're saying. Um, but uh, I, I'm just very positive on that. So um, I like it, and I think that I will support this. Because it's something that we will have and um, something that you can touch. And some of these other things that we spent money on or that amount of money, it's like when to spend it, that's it. So thank you. Okay, anything else? Anybody else first? Well, Ms. Powell. Just one quick follow-up. What is the artist fee? I'll have to go back and double-check that. I don't want to tell you the wrong answer <clears throat> right now. But it, it is included in that 120, as well as the puzzle wall and uh, all the expenses are anticipated in that amount. Okay. Mr. Thorne. Thank you. Uh, I think it's a very interesting project, and I think that some of the words expressed up here, it'll be something that will be cherished, it'll be part of Elgin's history, and I know that I'm going to buy multiple ones for my relatives in South Carolina, Mark. Thank you. Okay. Uh, I'm going to support this as well. I think that uh, you never know sometimes uh, what types of things strike a chord with people. And I'm going to use that. We have uh, Elgin's being uh, highlighted in a documentary that's being showcased in Chicago next week. And uh, it came from the violin display and the um, violins of hope. Uh, display and it's called Growing Hope and Elgin got highlighted uh, because of our community and it was never intended for that to happen but that's what grew out of that and sometimes you see things like this and people look at it as a historic community we we like to uh, cherish our history and show our history and this is an opportunity to do that so I'm going to support it I think it's a good idea anything else okay clerk please call the roll Councilmember Stixon yes Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Ortiz. Yes. Powell. No. Rauschenberger. No. Stephan. Yes. Thorne. Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes. Motions approved seven two. Item D is a redevelopment agreement with Trias LLC and Side Street Studio Arts NFP. Side Street is a not-for-profit organization. Well, actually, we don't need to go through this. We went through this in the zoning. Uh, this is this is um, this is the consideration of the financial assistance to the uh, Central Area TIF Fund for the first phase of the project worked at the studio. Phase one will be establishing, as we heard, the main gallery and exhibition space on the first floor, along with new restrooms. Um, lower level and second floor will not be occupied in phase one. The first phase of the development is expected to cost just under $2 million, uh, with the total redevelopment cost approaching just over $4.5 million. Um, this initiative is, again, for the first phase of the funding, $500,000 for an expected um, uh, job that will cost $2 million. Move for approval. Second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz? 
All right, I ask every time. So if, if, this get, if this gets approved and then the 500 goes to side street, how much do we have left in the bank? So this is getting close to the end. There's a number of factors where there are projects that haven't been expended, but in terms of the planned projects, including the, the Dundee Avenue rehabilitation, and this project, we're getting close to the end of the expiration of the TIF in 2025 with major projects available for funding. Part of the funding on this also requires the increment to be received from the county in the future. We don't have the money for this immediately now. It will have to be issued when the, um, when the final checks come from King County at the expiration of the TIF. So yes, this is the last big project. Okay. Well. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Ms. Martinez. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I will support this item tonight, and I would like the community to understand that the funding through a TIF is meant to improve and support blight in the TIF district. Uh, the improvements that will be made to this building will be a long-term benefit to downtown Elgin and will be a good use of TIF funds. This funding will bring growth and success to Side Street Studio, but more importantly, it will work towards getting one more building in downtown area that um, can be occupied and generate some activity. Uh, these are my reasons for supporting this item. Thank you. Okay. Anything else? Mr. Mar uh, Mr. Stefan. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Um, I, I just wanted to point out, based on the answer to Council Person Ortiz's question, that this really reinforces the need to renew the TIF or create a new TIF. Um, I'm just going to highlight that because I think uh, we're to Side Street's credit and to Mark and uh, Neighborhood Services' credit. We're doing this in phases, but that means we have to have the money in order to get to phases two and three. So I just want to point out that this really reinforces how we have to get that TIF renewed or a new one in place. So that's that was my comment. Okay. Anything else, Mr. Good? Thank you, Mayor. <clears throat> um, so um, with this project, I mean, when I first heard about it, um, I was like, "This is a slam dunk use of TIF funds." <laughs> As far as I know, um, the organization is, I mean, personally for me, when I first moved to Elgin back in, I think, 2008, 2009, um, we used to hang out at the Goss House. And then I really didn't have any reason to venture further east, even if it was a couple blocks. Um, but I remember somebody bringing this up that this place existed. And so we went and checked it out. And it was just that nice, oh, okay, there's like some buzz happening here. Um, so I, I bring up kind of the intangibles because we've talked a lot about art this evening and this is very homegrown, not only for the, the folks who are doing this, um, the community that you've built is like, they're here. Um, the, and, and in the case of the last item, you know, we're, we're mixing in a national name um, and I think that's, that's great that we have people here who understand the different levels of things happening and generating uh, good energy for us. But um, I just want to take this opportunity to say thank you so much. Um, not only for the environment that you've built, but for sticking around. Um, I think everybody who's been here <clears throat> and through the pandemic knows that, you know, restaurants were getting knocked off. Theaters in downtown Chicago were getting closed. Um, meanwhile, you guys were out making art bags and delivering them to people in the community. So you've uh, got my nieces excited about art. You know, you've <laughs> supported my, my little brother in art. Um, my wife and I have had some of our best nights out in downtown Elgin because of you guys. Um, just leaving EPH, walking down the alley, and randomly walking into a concert. Um, it makes us feel like there's kind of a city life happening here. Um, not to mention the residuals. You know, as a bartender, there'd be people popping in that I've never seen before. What are you here for? Side Street. What are you here for? Side Street. Um, so the residuals are there. You guys have built a great community. I, I really cannot wait to see what Grove is turning into, or what, what it does continue to evolve into, I should say. Um, and this huge commitment that you're making, uh, I can't overstate how excited I think everybody up here is for this. So thank you so much. And obviously I'm going to support this and everything in the future. Okay. Ms. Powell. Thank you. A um, couple things I'd like to point out. Um, first of all, thanks to Aaron and Tanner for, I, I, this is the word I want to use, 
being a game changer in our downtown because Side Street really has been a game changer in our downtown in terms of the arts scene, in terms of uh, bringing folks to our community that haven't been here before, um, in terms of your collaboration and engagement with folks, um, bringing organizations together, bringing different people together, um, being open and inclusive. I, I can't overstate um, how that contributes to the vitality of our community and in particular the vitality of our downtown. This whole row, for those of you who don't know where this is, on Grove, on South Grove Avenue, is really starting to fill in. And with you all t occupying this space, we are really building a critical mass of where folks will come from Burns and from Bee's Latin Kitchen and from Kubo's and now to Side Street and to El Patio. So that whole portion of South Grove, we're, we're creating foot traffic there that didn't exist there just a few years ago. And we already heard the presentation from Amanda about the economic impact of the arts. So I'm not even going to go into that again, but that's, that's a real thing. And the economic impact of what Side Street has brought and continues to bring and will continue to bring to our community is real. Um, the fact that, again, that this building has sat vacant for 20 years is a perfect opportunity for us to invest TIF dollars here. Without this TIF money, it would make it nearly impossible for another investor, for any investor, to come in and bring this particular property up to up to code. That's what TIF dollars are for. That's one of the re that's one of the reasons TIF dollars are so important, because these improvements stay with the building. If Side Street Studios. Uh, st studio arts become so big at some point 20 years down the line and they move to California and they're in Hollywood all of those improvements that we've made in that building stay with the building um, so I, I like to point that out because people look at the, the price tag and say oh that's a whole lot of money to spend on um, a nonprofit in downtown but when you look at the fact that we are bringing back a property that hasn't been used in 20 years, what they contribute to the community. Um, I'm, I'm fully in support of it. Um, I, think, I think I've said everything I wanted to say, but I just want to say thanks to both of you for your energy, your positivity, your creativity. Um, I've always enjoyed working with you. I am so excited uh, to see this project come to fruition. Um, I, I like the phased approach of what you're doing because it's, it's a lot to bite off and um, I will definitely be supporting it. Thank you. Okay, anything else? Mr. Dixon. Thank you. Um, I was able to take a tour of Side Street of the building maybe about, I don't know, six months ago, maybe longer, six to eight months ago. And I, too, was surprised by how huge it was. I think it was like three or four different levels. Um, three, okay. And um, how long the, I mean, it's just a, a massive space. And I'm, you know, picturing in my mind, like all of the things that you're going to be doing in there, it's going to be crazy. Because I get the emails, right, and I know of the events that are happening, what feels like every single day. And just to see what you've done with your current space, I can only imagine how many levels you guys are going to raise your impact in this community by how huge that space is. Um, so congratulations. Um, you guys are Elgin. You know, we have locations downtown that create foot traffic. We have the library, of course. We have the center, of course. Um, we, um, 
and I'm drawing a blank, you know, but the Hemmings and, you know, so we have these locations and then there's side street and you guys create the type of foot traffic that go to the rest of these restaurants that go to the rest of these shops who live in our downtown or near it. People travel from other communities to come to your events because they don't have this option. And so you have created an environment that is going to have a lasting impact on this, on this community beyond the rest of our lives. And so you've done something that's bigger than all of us and you should be congratulated for that. So thank you. Um, I also want to say thank you to city staff for working with side street and getting this done and getting this to the finish line. I appreciate it. Um, the community needed this and you made sure that it happened. And I want to tell you, thank you for working with them on this. They, not just have a, a huge impact on the residents here, but you know, also our cultural arts commission um, and the way that we function. We literally throw events in the city around what Side Street does. We get ideas from what you all do. So it's just, this is just a beautiful thing. Um, I'm gonna leave it right there. I have no issues with this you know, spending this amount of money. Um, I would like to spend more. Uh, every dollar is needed for this. So, right. <laughs> they do. Yeah. <laughs> so um, just congratulations and thank you to city staff for everything that you've done. You guys um, go forward and conquer. So thank you. Okay. Anything else? Ms. Rauschenberg. Yeah. Um, just what everybody else said. Um, I've always said that the energy in downtown is really with Side Street Studio Arts, that you hung in there, and thank you for hanging in there. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9-0. Item E is the renewal of the purchase of service agreement with the Youth Empowerment Program. The police department is seeking to enter into renewal agreement with community liaisons Jeff Ligon and Aaron Cobb, who will continue facilitating the YEP program, which includes home visits, identifying participants for focused family visits, social service needs, and general community outreach. The police department continues to work collectively with all stakeholders in the YEP program and will continue to develop the program so that the needs of the community are met. Move for approval. Second. Move the second for approval. Any discussion? I, I should mention we have Chief Lally here this evening along with Mr. Cobb and Mr. Ligon. Should anybody wish to commend them for the good work that they're doing? Okay. Okay. Any questions? Mr. Dixon. Yeah, I'm not going to commend them for the work that they're doing just yet. <laughs> but I would like to have an, an update on, on where we are with YEP uh, as far as participation, numbers are concerned. Um, you know, growth, um, involvement from your staff. Yes, good evening, everyone. So I'm joined today um, with Aaron Cobbs, Jeff Ligon, and then uh, Community Outreach Specialist Danny Flores, who works for the police department. Um, so in terms of, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to step aside and let them give you guys the update. Um, I will say from my perspective, the program uh, began in... Well, we started planning this in 2020. And so the program actually took off in October of 2021. Uh, we had consultants who came in, helped us for a little bit of time, uh, left in June of 2022. And then from then it was really uh, police personnel staff and then Jeff and Aaron who had been there since the very beginning. And so last year uh, we entered into a contract with Jeff and Aaron. Um, it's been very successful. I think the energy that they bring along with um, Danny, who is just amazing in the community. He's only been with the police department for a very short time, but the relationships, um, the trust, um, some of the outcomes, and I think, again, it's a, a new program. It's been only a few years. We probably need a couple more years to make some adjustments, um, and that's part of this and part of the growing. Uh, but from my perspective, it's uh, absolutely doing what we wanted it to do and also um, replacing things that we had conversations in 2020 that maybe the community was not too happy with. 
um, and there was something that we needed to do better at, and I think this program is absolutely um, the start of that. So I'm gonna step aside and let these gentlemen talk a little bit about their perspective and uh, the program from um, how they view it. Oh, good evening, everybody. Um, so where we're at as far as we up, I think um, everybody's well aware of how we started and, and how things go, and it's kind of how we're identifying juveniles. Um, where we're at right now is that we're coming together with the staff of the schools, and we're kind of figuring out what your school looks like, who are the movers and shakers in your schools. Um, so currently right now we have about 20 kids at Elgin and Larkin. Um, Danny has kind of started at Central, where they have a group of kids, um, myself and Detective Ramirez, um, over at Kimball, we started a group at Kimball Middle School, um, as well as there's one with Danny started over at Larson, where there's about roughly 10 to 15 kids in each of those. So <clears throat> when you look at it, we're now touching kids from seventh grade all the way through 12th grade now. Next year will be the first year of graduating kids, and that cycle will just start going, kind of going in circles, uh, which is kind of what you want, where we want the older kids kind of mentoring the younger kids, and we kind of facilitate that. So f from the from that standpoint, I think it's been a success. So that's kind of where we're at. I don't know if you guys. I heard this African proverb says, it takes a village to raise a child. And when I came into um, the Elgin Police Department and I started working with Jeff and Aaron, and I got to make some, some visits with them, the impact that they're having in our community, right? Not only inside of the school, but outside of the school, in the neighborhood. Is just is just amazing, right? Uh, the outcome, uh, what we're seeing, the transformation from each transformation. So it's really it's taking, right, a village to be able to raise the children, the young people in our community, and they're doing a phenomenal job. So I just want to thank you guys for for the effort and everything that you guys do. So it's it's really working miracles. It's working miracles. So uh, thank you for supporting. You know, so far what's been happening, and we hope to continue to do a better job here in the city. Yeah. And, and I'll just say, um, and I, and I want to say first, uh, thank you to Chief Lally, because when um, when we said that we have some issues and we have we want to and we want things to change, um, she sat down and she said, all right, let's do it. You know, if you're willing to do the work, let's do it. And so you put your money where your mouth is and you spent a lot of time uh, sitting down with us and building it. Um, and so thank you for doing for doing what you do because it's not always uh, easy thank so, you so thank you uh, happy to see you on board Danny uh, I, I told I told chief that she probably she couldn't have picked a better person uh, for your role um, and so so thank you um, uh, Keith Aaron thank you guys for for just being uh, who I've always known to stand up guys uh, and, and giving back to the community um, I, I do I have one more question as far as the the uh, number of visits mm -hmm. uh, completed, um, and then also trips. Um, I know there are some trips, so can we talk? Can you guys talk a little bit about that? The number of trips, total visits. Yeah. So overall, the so there's um, home visits that take place, family intervention visits that mm -hmm. take place. Um, so throughout the program, um, I think in the in the memo at the time was 77. It's actually more than that. Um, so I will send the council an updated uh, number. Um, and that's since the beginning of the program. Um, in terms of the trips, you want to talk about that? He doesn't have specific numbers, but can talk in general. Yeah, so the trips, um, what we try to do is every quarter, like every quarter of the school year, we try to take them somewhere. You know, I had a, I had a football coach when I was younger, and he said that, in, in order to grow your mind, I got to get you outside of 90 and 20, right? Just so that you can see what's outside of here so that you can dream a little bit bigger. So we try to take the kids places. You know, we've taken them to NIU, the college store. Um, we've taken them to the Windy City Bulls game. Um, we're looking to try to take them, I want to say, the little go-kart place out in Addison, um, just as at the end of the school year thing, because these kids that have been with us, um, a lot of them have been with us for the last two years, and, you know, we don't make them come to these groups. They're beating down the door to come, right? On Wednesdays, I'm getting phone calls nonstop from these kids. Oh, Mr. Cobbs, you coming? You coming? You know, because they want to be in part of this. Um, so the, the trips that we've planned is just kind of reward them and also kind of expand their vision of where they could be. Um, so and we're also bringing people in from the community, come and talk to them about, you know, how they came, where they came from, how they got to where they're at, um, and kind of teach them that you can invest in yourself and one day make something of yourself. So. 
Nice. All right. Uh, I think that's all I have. And I also just want to give a shout out to Nancy Coleman of the Alignment Collaborative for Education. She's given a lot to the program, a lot of time to as well, uh, that organization. So if you're listening out there, thank you, Nancy. Mr. Ortiz. Uh, I just want to go off of what Mr. Dixon said about you putting your money where your mouth is, Chief. We used to remember a couple years ago, a lot of people were protesting and advocating that your department put more money into the community and uh, some of your budget money should go into programs like this. And from the financial analysis, it's saying that this is coming out of your operational budget. So I appreciate you doing what Mr. Dixon said and putting your money, with, or putting your, yeah, putting the money into the program. Thank you. So you are spreading some of your money around back into the community. Maybe some people would like more, but this is a start, and I appreciate it. If you guys need more money, you know who to go shake down. <laughs> else? Well, ultimately, they got to come here. <laughs> right down this way. Okay, Ms. Powell. I just want to echo um, some of the statements that have already been made. Know all of you. Um, thank you, Chief. Thank you, Danny, Aaron, Keith. Um, heard great things about what you're doing. Um, excited to see where this goes. Um, as for budget, I, I think we're getting a lot of this pretty cheaply. Um, you know, compared to the outcomes that, that we're seeing and the dividends that it will eventually pay in our community. So I, I just want to say that. Um, so hopefully we can expand the budget to include more of the trips and to pay the staff more um, from an equity lens perspective. I th that is very important to me. Um, I also want to, there's a question, and I talked yep. to you about this earlier. Since we were working and partnering with U46 on this um, this uh, program, we have U46. We have Elgin students that go to that attend schools outside of Elgin. How are we including some of those students that may need assistance that may go to South Elgin or? go to a Bartlett school or, or Streamwood school? So the, the program would be available to those students if, um, whether it's a referral, um, I can make a, a phone call just to uh, the superintendent and of U46 and advise her to just so that that connection is there so they know um, in case the referral doesn't come in or somebody doesn't know about the program. Additionally, we'll contact, once I, once I speak to the superintendent, then making contact with the principals of those schools too so that they know the program is there for students who uh, live in Elgin but attend South Elgin. So um, that's just uh, on, on our part, we can, we can absolutely do that communication. Great, I'd like to see that. The other question, last question I have is, um, since we are collaborating with the school district, mm -hmm. have we um, tracked any metrics of the students that we're working with to see that since they've been involved with the program, have their referrals gone down? Have their grade point averages gone up? Um, are we seeing some measurable metrics with, with these students in terms of um, their behavior, their academic success, anything like that? So um, that's a question that Councilman Ortiz had asked me to uh, prior to the meeting. So the metrics we keep are the home visits or the family intervention visits, the number of referrals that we have, and we're currently working on ways to improve the outcome of those referrals. The, our system currently now, there, we have to build that. So you may have a student who's referred into the program and maybe the outcome is they attend a counseling session or um, you know, they do something. So we're trying to build um, that, I guess, the, the end part so that we can get some better metrics. So that's part of building the program too. So that's gonna take us a little bit of time. We're already working on it. Additionally too, um, you know, the whole concept of YEP is to always have those resources in place for people in the community. So even though they're referred because something's happening, they're trying to get involved in gangs or maybe they're fighting or maybe there's some conflict, the goal is once they're there and once they get immersed into whatever it is that they need, that those resources will always be there. So that might be more of, you know, I would say, give us a couple of years, especially with, um, Aaron had mentioned one of the classes that will be graduating. That would be a good test group to have a, um, and one of the things that Danny and I talked about the other day was doing like a pre-survey and a post-survey. Mm -hmm. So when they enter into YEP and get exposed to whether it's the mentorship or the opportunities, what do they feel, what do they think, what are they involved in, 
and then after maybe three months or six months, do another survey and see, you know, what has changed. Because a lot of it will be anecdotal, right? Like, mm -hmm. I feel I don't want to get involved in the gang anymore. Or I found a mentor. Or my perspective has changed, and now I would like to go into some type of profession. So I think this group is something that Danny and I talked about doing that with, because this would be the good group to do it with. And then continue to evolve those methods for data collection, which mm -hmm. eventually if we look for other funding sources, which Councilman Ortiz had asked me about. Will be critical, it'll yeah, be critical we would to need, have so that data. We still need a little bit of time um, to get some of that information, but we're aware of it and working on it. Thank you. Yeah. Mr. Steph. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I echo everybody else. Thank you to everybody for your efforts in this. Um, I see this as, and I think I've mentioned this maybe, um, kind of a growth of this program beyond the police department and it's mm -hmm. starting to kind of be its own, stand on its own, and I think that's good. The one question I do have, and you mentioned mentors a couple times, have you had adequate support from business leaders and religious leaders? I think we talked about that when this was established. Mm -hmm. Is that happening? Do you yeah, so have the support? We're currently at 22 community partners, and so initially when we started, I think we were at maybe 10 or 12, but Danny has done a tremendous job, and Aaron and Jeff, and that's one thing I wanted to say before. Um, these, what they have done, especially, you know, just it's an idea, it's a concept, and then to actually see it happening, and the relationships that are formed, not, not only with the community, but with the police department, and with the police officers who also do an exceptional job, the school resource officers. Mm -hmm. Um, Danny just coming in and getting all these people on board. Um, this program, so I want to say thank you to the community. Thank you to the community partners. Thank you to the council for supporting this initiative. Thank you to Councilman Dixon for, you know, having those conversations with us. And, and that needs to be said because five years from now or ten years from now when probably none of us are here, um, I know I won't be here. Um, <laughs> now... <laughs> You know, you this keep, program you keep will continue. Us. You keep reminding us. Yeah. <laughs> Try not to. Um, this program will continue. And then what you're going to see is you're going to see the generations of stories where maybe 10 or 15 years ago there was a story about uh, an encounter with a, a police officer that's now different. And that gets passed on to generations and generations because the way the YEP program started was Jeff and I walking around the police department um, at least how it got was brought to me. We were walking in a protest together, and he was telling me his life story. And then through that, um, I didn't even know that you know you had a connection. And then you know we came in and just had these conversations. So this program, five years from now and ten years from now, you'll see the difference. And and it's because of people like these gentlemen behind me too. So I want to say thank you to everyone for that. Okay. okay. Anything else? Anybody else? Okay, Mr. Dixon. Yeah, I just want to hear Jeff step up to the mic and say something. <laughs> <laughs> because he acts, like, he, he acts like he doesn't want to speak. But if you ever watch him speak in a room full of these kids, they are captivated. Because his story is real and it's honest and he gets their attention. He meets them where they're at. So, so thank you for being you, yeah. Keith. And if you want to say a few words, please. Uh, uh, well, I just really want to say, um, you know, with, with this program, you know, I have um, just, as, just a, um, as an example, I have my son in this program at Larkin High School, right? So when we go up to Larkin High School, he's in the YEP groups. You know, that's just to show that, you know, it's not, I'm damn sure I ain't gonna let nobody target my child. But so, you know, just so it's not about Target, but also even when he was going to um, Kimball with Aaron and Ramirez, Lizandro, I call them two different names, but <laughs> but um, with working with the SROs and working with Aaron, um, it built a relationship. My son built a relationship with Lizandro to the point right. where, you know, um, he felt comfortable with him being in the school, going to him, talking to him if he had an issue and stuff like that, you know. So it's just, you know, with this program, it's building relationships, and, you know, now whereas now if you see my son, all I want it, if you see my son out there doing something, call me, and he'll do it. He'll be like, hey, Jeff, I see your son over here, man. Hey, boy, get home. 
you know, <laughs> stuff like that. And, and, and like you said, sometimes it take a village, you know. Instead of, you know, first thing he thinking, man, lock my son up. He, hey, you better go home about to tell your dad, you know, stuff like that. So, you know, I appreciate that. I appreciate that from the police department and everything, you know. So, but that's what this did. It, it, it's helping to build good relationships, I believe. So, thank you. Thank and you. for folks who don't know, Lisandro is the SRO yes. at Kimball. Yes, correct. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Okay. okay, clerk, please call a roll. Councilmember Stixon. Yes. Good. Yes. Martinez. Yes. Ortiz. Yes. Powell. Yes. Rauschenberger. Yes. Stephan. Yes. Thorne. Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes. Motions approved nine zero. Item F is the U.S. Route 20 mm -hmm. Long Common Parkway to Coombs Road Phase 1 Design Engineering Services Amendment Agreement Number 1 with H.R. Green Incorporated. Public Services Director Mike Pubins and Community Development Director Mark Malott continue driving their efforts to turn that section of U.S. 20 into a four-lane highway. This initiative is for the more complex process of completing the Phase 1 study necessary to analyze and refine the four-lane concept for improving traffic operations, multimodal operations, and safety in this corridor. The Phase 1 process will take about 18 months to complete and will culminate with the Illinois Department of Transportation's Department's approval of a project development report, which will then enable Mark and Mike to have the city initiate phase two of the final design activities. Unlike Chief Lally, who isn't making a commitment to staying here, Mark and Mike will be here through 27 and 2028 20, with the expected construction of this, of improvements. It's in the memo. <laughs> Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Ortiz. I got one for city manager. Maybe he knows or doesn't mm -hmm. know. So in the background, it says uh, Pace does not provide services west of Randall. Is there, since we keep expanding that way and improving that way, are we ever going to get Pace to make extra routes going into Providence and areas back there? Well, this referred the multimodal operations that they referred to in the, in the analysis. That will be part of the study, if I'm not mistaken. And Mr. Poobins is doing the right yeah. thing and not disagreeing with what the manager is stating <laughs> from the dais. So, but that, that, that's what's contemplated as part of this. Okay. Yeah. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Council Members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Braschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. The motion is approved 9 0. Item G is the U.S. Route 20 and Ryan King Road Roundabout Project Intergovernmental Agreement between the City and the Illinois Department of Transportation for Associated Maintenance. Uh, projects with municipalities often have features that are of local benefit, such as street lighting and landscaping improvements. And because of that, the Illinois Department of Transportation requires the local agency, that would be the City, to take maintenance responsibility. If approved, this agreement will commit the City to paying future costs for the lighting maintenance and electricity costs and for retaining the landscaping improvements within the roundabout. Move for approval. Second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Mr. Stemmer. Just, I just want to make the point, this is pretty standard when there's a state highway. And that is correct. And the city's involved. Okay. That's correct. Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain. Yes, motions approved 9 0. Items H through I are all variations on the theme, on themes, acceptance of public improvements and easements within certain properties. Item H is for public improvements and in the easement at 1151 North State Street. This is the Judson University Athletic Field. Move approval. Second. Move for approval. Any discussion? I want to make it clear there's a water main that goes around yeah. that field that was relocated so they could do that construction. Okay. Clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item I, public improvements and easement, easement acceptance at 1700 Madeline Lane. This is public, yeah, public water main and sidewalks. Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Move for approval. Second. Been moved and seconded. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Council members Dixon? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item J is the acceptance of public improvements at 1705 Madeline Lane. This involves water main and sidewalks as well. Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Council Dixon? Yes. 
Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item K is a right of way encroachment license agreement at 70 Airport Road. Move for approval. Second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item I, acceptance of public improvements for water main and sidewalk and a plat of easement for water main and stormwater management at 711 East Chicago Street. Move for approval. Second. Move and second of any discussion. Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item M is amendments to the 2023 budget consistent with the Illinois Municipal Budget Law. That law requires the approval of year end adjustments that reflect the actual financial and programmatic changes approved by the City Council during the budget year. That essentially means we plan to spend things in a certain way and expect a certain amount of revenue. And when those items change, it's uh, incumbent upon the Chief Financial Officer to make those changes to the 23 budget in accordance with the law. This year, the big items are revenue adjustments in the amount of about $3.4 million. Um, adjustments totaling $820,000 were used, uh, were made to use, excuse me, to show the use of escrow funds. Particularly, $635,000 from public safety impact fees was used to purchase police department vehicles. The budget was also adjusted to reflect the use of general fund reserves, the amount of $1.1 million to provide additional funding for the renovation efforts at the Hemans Cultural Center. Those are the primary changes. Um, the remainder changes of the budget are involved purchase orders rolled over from 2022. And as many of you probably recall, these changes were all approved by the council in advance of this truing up of the budget in accordance with the law. Move for approval. Second. It's been moved and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stephan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item N is the sale of general obligation corporate purpose bonds to finance utility fund projects. The city once again has the opportunity to borrow a portion of the funding required to complete the 2024 lead service line replacement program. The Illinois Environmental Protection Agency's public water supply loan program uh, has approved the city for $7 million in an interest-free loan. I say interest-free loan because it is no longer a forgivable loan program. There's a possibility that the loan could be increased to the amount of almost $9 million. And this is because communities that were expected to subscribe for these loans are declining to do so once they found out that, that there was interest attached to that. Um, to the city's benefit, the IEPA has, instead of making them forgivable loans, are providing them as zero interest loans. Depending on how much the city receives from the IEPA to cover that necessary $16 million, the bonding will only reflect that remainder amount. So if we get $9 million from the IEPA, we will only seek bonding the amount of $7 million. That's expected to be about 4.5% interest. Move approval. Second. It's been moved to second for approval. Any discussion? I have a question for you. Okay. Uh, who establishes the timeline for the repayment schedule? Uh, the IPA does. Okay. Yes. Okay. Yeah. But as if there, well, in this instance, one page of when there's interest involved to the degree that she can, Chief Financial Officer uh, Naraki will always increase payments. But in this instance, with zero percent, I have a sense that she won't have that same degree of okay. urgency. Yeah. Okay, clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Braschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item O is the National Pollution Discharge Elimination System Permit Phase 2 Stormwater Permit Compliance Project. This is Amendment Number 3 to the current agreement with Baxter and Woodman Incorporated. This agreement continues the ongoing engineering services needed to supplement the city staff abilities to meet the regulations pertaining to the 2024 NPDES monitoring. Move, Move for approval. Second. Move to second for approval. Any discussion? 
Hearing none, court, please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item P is the Festival, Festival Park Splash Pad Rehabilitation Contract Change Order Number 1. Festival Park Splash Pad was opened in 2007 and went, underwent a comprehensive rehabilitation last year. Um, during the rehabilitation process, leakage from the surrounding ground into the surge pit was observed. This proposed change order, uh, just under $20,000, will address the leakage and seal the pit to prevent future leakage in the future. The proposed work will begin immediately after approval so final testing can be completed so the fountain can open by Memorial Day weekend. Move for approval. Second. Move and second for approval. Any discussion? Hearing none, court please call the roll. Councilmember Stixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes. Motions approved 9 0. Item Q is change order number two to the Jack Cook Park final construction phase. When this project was initially bid, artificial turf was specified for surfacing at the playground. Since the time of this bid, staff have located playground surfacing vendor that offers a very sustainable project. This change order is to use that vendor that supplies the project, and it's about $14,000 difference. The product specified for use um, is, does not contain any PFAS materials. It also uses a multi-layered multi backing system created from soybean plants that are 100% renewable resources. The final backing layer is comprised of recycled plastic bottles from the Project Yellowstone. Uh, project an innovative recycling partnership uh, that's used in conjunction with Yellowstone National Park. The use of recyclable materials is the focal point of the company for the city that will be providing the turf at this area. Move approval. Second. Second. Move, and set, move for approval. Uh, any discussion? Ms. Rauschenberg. Um, of course I will not be supporting this. Um, we take a, a beautiful uh, pristine natural area and lay down plastic. So I, I, even though it's a, a better product, um, I, I don't support this in any of our parks. Anything else? Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? No. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, motions approved 8-1. Announcements from the council. Mr. Thorne. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to echo a couple of your words from earlier this evening. Regarding this town, cherish our history and show our history. Also, educate and preserve our history. No place does it better than the Elgin History Museum. And Saturday, August 20th at the Holiday Inn is the annual Elgin History Museum's gala. Uh, I know that uh, the council members have opportunities to attend, and I certainly would invite the public and hope that they would support and come to this wonderful event and keep our great museum going forward that educates children and adults and the like and preserves history. Then secondly, just a little fun, uh, it's my favorite weekend of the year, the Masters Golf Tournament. Yes, that is why I'm wearing this jacket. I was just going to ask. Enjoy, everybody. <laughs> Anything else? Any other announcements from the council? Ms. Rashford. Oh, yes. Oops. Yeah, thank you. Uh, um, we are, I want to invite everyone on the council and everyone in our community to attend the second annual Elgin Earth Summit. Um, this is a community event to prom promote sustainability and foster community engagement during Earth Month, as this is Earth Month. Um, I know there, the city has um, programs going on um, around the city, including Hawthorne Hill. Um, there will be three uh, talks by local and regional sustainability leaders. Um, I think of interest is we're going to talk about the Kane County Climate Action Plan um, and its implementation as Kane County is just finishing their Climate Action Plan. We're talking about uh, multimodal transportation and um, environmental justice. So, and, and to encourage people to come, you can, if you uh, attend, you can enter a drawing to win a free EV bike, um, an elect electric bike, and um, worth over $2,000. So I hope everyone will attend 
and um, have a chance to learn about the earth and, and get an EV bike. Thank you. I thought you were going to say it's a free Tesla. <laughs> you got me excited for a minute. <laughs> I thought it wasn't that big. <laughs> yes. Okay, anything from staff? No, Mayor, thank you. Okay, entertain a motion to adjourn to the executive session. So move. So move. Second. Move and second to adjourn. Clerk, please call the roll. Councilmember Dixon? Yes. Good? Yes. Martinez? Yes. Ortiz? Yes. Kyle Powell? Yes. Rauschenberger? Yes. Stefan? Yes. Thorne? Yes. Mayor Captain? Yes, we are adjourned. Have a good evening.